Is the mic on? Shouldn't be. Fuck, it's on. <laughs> I need to put it. Three, two, one, one week later. Hello world, <laughs> how are you doing? Is everything fine? Is everybody in the house? I already saw someone chatting from, uh, from the Slack workspace. So I believe that somebody is awake and uh, ready to roll. But if you can write anything in the chat so I know that you are here with me, because I haven't found yet a way to understand if how many people are watching right now uh, there must be a way and i will probably find one i will probably need a second monitor so i can uh, check the twitch dashboard but anyway for now it's just a, a homemade thing so it's fine like this i was also messing up with the microphone so for the past five minutes i was just uh, mumbling and saying, oh, is this on? Hello, hello. <laughs> and it was. Um, okay, nobody is chatting with me right now. Probably you're still connecting. Probably you're still waking up. Probably you're already bored by my constant chatting. But still, I'm going to check my dashboard. Hey, Shazaib, hi. I'm going to check my Ooh. dashboard. Hey. Okay, I'm going to stop this one. Hi Shazaiz, thanks for connecting. Shazaiz is one of my former students and uh, one of the best ones, I could say. Seven people here connected. So, oh, Tabri, good morning. <laughs> so there, you are there too. Awesome. Okay, so I think we can start. Uh, there's uh, probably enough people. Hey, PNTM, nice to see you here with us. Okay, so I'm going to the coding mode. So we are able to start right away. Today, we're going to write our first pieces of code and uh, actually we're going to uh, create our first website and even deploy it on the web. But first, I need to do a small recap of what we've done last week. And I would also like to discuss the exercises that we've made together. 
So uh, those exercises are really, really important because they are not really coding, but very, very similar to coding. And especially the maze 10 that some of you already challenged themselves with and some not, we can do this together and uh, learn a lot of things from that, from that maze. So before going to the second batch of slides, I'll go back to the first batch of slides. Oh, I see some people that are uh, actually reading the slides. I'm not going to go forward uh, back again in every slide. I just want to um, remember one thing. Uh, I said that you should try to be as social as possible and use Slack, but I forgot to tell you anything about Slack. Maybe you don't know how it works, so uh, I will start with a crash course on Slack and uh, a couple of best practices that I think we should follow in order to use it uh, productively, as productively as possible. So first of all, uh, I should have Slack opened. Here it is. And uh, the first thing that I would like to check is the notifications. You know that you are always notified by Telegram, WhatsApp, Facebook Messenger or um, whatever uh, chatting message you use. Here, uh, you are notified um, in the most discreet way possible, which means usually never. So uh, you can customize how you are notified on Slack. Um, if you have the desktop application or even the website, it's fine. You can go to your preferences here and decide if you want to be notified about all new messages or just direct messages, mentions and keywords or not be notified at all. And you can use a different kind of uh, setting, notification setting for your mobile device. So if you have the Slack app on your phone, you can decide to be notified for all new messages on your phone and only for on direct messages on your computer or vice versa or whatever you want. Also, there are specific notifications that you can uh, switch on for specific channels. So not here, but probably if you go inside of the channel, for example, I'm in the school's channel, somewhere here, there should be a way to change the notifications. You see, I can change the notification for the channel called schools, and I can say, I want to be notified for every new message or just for mentions or for nothing. And the same goes with mobile devices. As for me, since I'm the owner of this Slack workspace, as you could see, I will be notified for everything because I want to, uh, to know everything that's going on in my workspace. But this is not your case. You probably want to, hey, Ricardo, hello world. Looking forward to today's webinar. Here I am. Are you already there? I hope so. Uh, join us immediately if you haven't yet. Um, so you can be notified uh, the way you like, uh, but please try to be notified at least a little bit. Because, for example, yesterday I said, hey students, how is it going? Are you practicing with the mazes on the keyboard? See you tomorrow. And nobody replied at all. Just PNTM uh, connected a while ago and uh, and we had a little chat on a thread which is another thing that I'm going to speak uh, about so try to fix the notification Esther comes from Milan hi Esther thank you for joining us so it's 11 o'clock for you uh, just as it is for me so if you turn off any kind of notifications except for a uh, um, mentions or channels, uh, then in order to reach you, I can do something like I'm going to use uh, Esther since she. Oh, and uh, Mick Skax comes from Torino. Uh, I have no idea how to pronounce your name, but I'm pretty sure that it's uh, probably a mixture of your first name and last name. But anyway, uh, you will tell me later. Okay, so uh, since Mick Skax just sent us this message on the on the twitch chat i'm going to ask him directly by mentioning him uh if he's here no he's not uh, he, he didn't uh, join the slack workspace yet but esther did so i'm going to ask esther you see i'm mentioning her esther hello i'm just doing this so this message will probably not notify anybody of you except esther if she has notifications on for mentions. 
so she will be notified and if I want to notify all the channel I can even say channel and the 68 people that belong to this channel will all be notified about this message which is actually a nasty move don't do that because lots of people don't want to be involved in something they they don't care about in fact I'm gonna write something to this channel. This is the only uh, moment in which I'm probably going to mention the whole channel. Uh, I created this channel to manage the Inglorious Academy on Twitch. I um, added all of you by default, but if you're not interested, feel free to leave the channel. Thank you. Okay, so I'm telling the whole channel in broadcast, if you want to stay, you can stay, but if you don't care about these messages, then you can leave and you will never notify notified about these messages. Okay, I hope. And it's always, uh, it's also saying, hey, do you really want to notify all 67 people, excluding me? Yes, I want, just this time. I know it's a dick move, but uh, I will do it just once. And this is my first swear word. I'm sorry. Uh, I will be probably <laughs> demonetized as soon as YouTube wants to monetize me. But I'm not expecting anything like that. So, this was about notifications and mentions. You can notify everyone by, um, by mentioning the whole channel, or you can notify a single person by mentioning that person with the at symbol. Another thing that you can do if you want to speak in private with someone, you can send a direct message. And I have a list of the most frequent people I speak to in this uh, direct messages section. But now I want to send a message to PNTM. So I'm going to open a direct message and I'm going to look for a PNTM. Here he is. And I say, hi, PNTM. Um, is there another way you want to be called or do you prefer PNTM? Okay, I'm gonna write this to him or to her. I don't know if uh, it's a he or a she actually. And um, I just know that he, she is from Indonesia. So now he will probably or she will probably reply to me and this will remain private in the chat and will remain public for you guys because uh, you are watching the stream with me. PNTM is typing. And let's see what they say. Okay, so this was direct messages and PNTM would be fine and I'm a he. Okay, thanks, thanks PNTM, okay. And this was a private message only from me to him. But you can always, you can even create group messages. So I can cr create a message with PNTM, but also with uh, Mirko. And you can have a private chat among students that speak uh, on, uh, on my back <laughs> if you want. You can do whatever you want. You're completely free to do anything you like, okay? And as you can see, you can even create your channels uh, channels will be public by default, which means that they can be mentioned with the hash symbol. But you can also create some private channels, uh, such as this one, Scale Apps, which has um, a lock as a symbol. So it's a private one. And uh, there are some ready-made channels for you guys. There's a Generals, which is the general default channel for a Slack in which we just say hello, um, have a cup of coffee together, that's it. Uh, but then there are other channels such as Docs in which we usually share useful information. For example, here I recently um, found a cool YouTube video on CSS and I wanted to share it with the channel. And we got helps in which people explain their problems with code, but not only, and people uh, try to, to, to help. And we've got ideas, and one of the ideas that came up is, hey, why don't you try streaming your, uh, your lessons on Twitch? And I said, nah, come on. But then one year later I said, yeah, you're probably right, why not? Uh, we've got a channel called Jobs, in which we, will, we are sharing job offers around the world, interesting job offers. 
and we've got lulls in which you can put whatever memes and jokes uh, you want. And then, of course, there's schools, which is about the academy. So here uh, I expect there to be the students, me and every any kind of volunteer that wants to help um, with this um, with this program. Then uh, another thing that I would like to show you is threads. So I'm going to I'm going to tell Ricardo uh, I'm going to follow up this conversation. So looking forward to today's webinar and I'm going to uh, reply to Ricardo, but I'm going to reply in the same thread. So how do I do that? I go to the right, there's a button toolbar here and there's this button here that says reply in thread. So I can click on here and now uh, a window appears on the side in which I can say um, we are already streaming are you there with us? Okay, so this reply remains in that specific place and doesn't clutter the whole uh, chat history with messages that are unrelated. So just like Facebook, you create a post and you create comments to that post. So everything will be uh, tidy. And we started doing such a thing here, for example, PNTM showed us that he solved Maze number 10, and we started replying in the same thread. Okay, uh, of course, you can put also reactions. So if you want to just not reply but react to a message, you have all the set of emoticons, of emojis that you want to use. Um, this is opposite to, uh, to Facebook. Ricardo said, Yep, yeah, I'm on. Okay, as you can see, he replied on the thread. So the that reply stays in there and doesn't clutter the message, uh, the, the, the chat history with unrelated messages. Another thing that I really like about Slack and Discord doesn't have, and probably that's the main reason why I chose to use Slack instead of Discord, but we're still on time to, to change, is that here we can even share code snippets. So you can write uh, blocks, blocks of code with uh, a couple of, um, of buttons that we have here. So if I click on code, I can say hello world and you see that the, the, the character, the color is strange, it's different. And well, it's because it's code. It's the, it's the font that we use in coding. It's a monospace code in which every character has the same width as every other character. And then we've got a block, a code block in which I can write more things, more things. I think I had need to do a shift enter to, to, to go to a new line. Let's see. And some more. I just press enter. Yeah. And this entered the, the message. So you can see that now I have two kind of different messages. And this looks like code. This doesn't look like code, actually. This looks like a uh, probably marked down code, so it's not really code. But then we also have another thing. If you go to this button here, shortcuts, um, there's create a code or text snippet. And this is really interesting because if I do this, I can put a title optionally and I can say hello.js and I'm gonna write some JavaScript code that you don't know about. So don't worry, you will understand all of this. You can add also some message, test code. And if I create this snippet, this is sort of like uh, attaching um, a text file and a code file. In fact, you can see there's some uh, syntax highlighting. This kind of thing here is in yellow, it's not in white, because the syntax of this code was recognized by Slack. And this is a cool way you can share your code with me during the stream. So if I'm writing code and you're following along, but my code works and your code doesn't work, then you can probably try to uh, debug this thing with me by sharing a snippet of code in this channel. Okay, I'm going to remove all of these messages. You can remove them, you can edit them, you can do whatever you want and I'm going to remove the snippet of code too. I'm gonna show you again, where is it? I'm gonna click on shortcuts and then create a code or text snippet. Or you can just search for a snippet keyword 
and you will find it pretty easily. Okay, this is some advanced features of Slack that I really like and could be really useful for us. And this goes for Slack. Another way you can communicate with me and give me feedback is outside of Slack and it's actually on Twitch. So I'm going to show you another thing from Twitch. Oh, wait a second. There's uh, probably Ricardo is writing now, but I don't see oh, an notification. Oh, what? Stream interrupted? Really? Hello, are you there for, with us? Reconnection successful. That's bad. Um, are you reconnected now? Hey, Baybus Coder is now following. This is cool. Okay, now it works. Nice. Okay, you're back. Sorry, guys. Uh, we had a whole, a whole slide about what could go wrong, and one of the things was technical problems. We're starting to have technical problems, unfortunately. I'm sorry for that. I hope that you didn't lose too much of my explanation. I was just uh, rehearsing the fact that we can create a code or text snippet. And then uh, we're just going to see another way that you can give me feedback um, outside of Slack. In fact, I'm still learning how to use Twitch, but there is a feature on Twitch that I added, which should be right in the chat or some, oh, here on the web, it's, it's this panel here. It's called a suggestion box. Sorry, guys. It's, a, it's called a suggestion box. So here you can uh, put some suggestions. People can vote on those suggestions and we can, I can reply. So, uh, for example, recently, well, recently, two weeks ago, I asked which chat app should we use for our community? Thumbs up if you prefer Slack. Thumbs down if you prefer Discord. I had a staggering amount of votes uh, that is zero votes so in fact finally i decided by myself i would use slack but i'm still open for feedback so if you want to to give me feedback feel free uh, and you can also add more suggestions and add more polls etc etc so this is what we are going to do in order to communicate more and have this uh, course even more live and that's it for the introduction i'm sorry this uh, lasted even longer than expected now as for practice time, last time I left you with a couple of tasks to perform. If you haven't performed that yet, that's fine. That's no problem. Uh, someone of, some of you joined me later, so there's no problem with that. And, um, but, and also some of you were probably busy. It's, uh, these are hard times and I, can, uh, I, I understand them completely. So, you know where to find the slides, tinyurl.com slash icacademy. You have the folder with all the slides. Join the community on Slack. This is a link. You can click on the link. I renewed the invitation link so you can join me on Slack even after two weeks. Uh, show file extensions and hidden files for those of you who didn't do it. Uh, on Windows, it is much better to set the visualization of files in the file manager so it shows file extensions and hidden files. If you don't know what I'm talking about, I will show it to you. Just uh, write on the chat, I don't know what you're talking about, and I will show you right now. But if I don't see anything, I will go on. Then, I asked you to install three pieces of software, which is Git, Node.js, and Visual Studio Code. Git and Node.js, we will use them a little later. Visual Studio Code is a text editor that I'm going to use today, but any text editor is fine. So if you didn't install Visual Studio Code, but you have Notepad or anything you, you have, that's fine. That's completely fine. Visual Studio Code is a little better, so uh, it would be nice. It's a nice to have, as we say. Then, the real exercises that I gave you are go to Blockly Games and solve mazes 1 to 9, and some of you even went to maze number 10, the most difficult one. And go to typing.io, which is another kind of game in which you can solve 
uh, a couple of those games in which you have to type fast and accurately uh, in JavaScript and in HTML, CSS. So let's go to Blockly Games and let's try to solve all the mazes from Blockly Games. I'm gonna make this a little bigger, well, maybe too much. Okay, I had to cheat on number 10, that was impossible. I so understand you, Veronica. <laughs> I know, yeah, uh, the 10th was really impossible, especially if you don't have any experience. I had lots of troubles with uh, maze number 10, and I cheated too at first, but then I found a couple of uh, ways to solve that without cheating, and I'm going to explain it, them to you today. It will not be easy, it will probably still be quite foggy, messy, but still, you will be probably able to understand the general concept on that. And when you will um, continue with this academy, when you will start coding and getting into the right mindset, you will probably go back to maze number 10 and be able to really understand it and solve it by yourself. So don't worry, it's, uh, it's pretty normal. So. I already told you how this game works. You have a block in the workspace and if you run the program you see that the person actually move, is moving forward. But you can stack two blocks together and this guy will move forward twice, thus reaching the goal. So the, uh, the maze is now solved. And it also shows you that this corresponds to two lines of JavaScript, which are move forward, open, close parenthesis, semicolon, move forward, open, close parenthesis, semicolon. That's it. So you wrote code in blocks instead of writing the, code, the JavaScript code, but that's actually pretty much the same thing. One day you will solve this kind of, uh, uh, of problems, by uh, thinking about the solution, but also writing it in code, which is a little more difficult because you have to, ha to be accurate in writing the code. So that's an extra challenge. So, maze number two. This guy wants to go right, then up, then right again. But we don't have blocks that say go right, go up. We have blocks that say move forward, turn left and turn right. So these blocks, seem to be more related to the current person's position. So he is already facing right, and the only thing that he has to do right now is to move forward in order to get closer to the goal. In fact, this goes well. Some people wrongly start turning right instead. So when I reset, they turn right because they want to face right. And this is not good because the guy was already facing right and if I turn right again, he's going to face south. So the, the, the only thing that we need to do is to move forward. And if I run the program, I see that he's closer to the goal, but not yet there. Okay, so now he's facing right, he wants to face north. And in order to face north, he has to turn on the left. Some people now start to uh, immediately uh, they, they think they understood the problem, so they say, okay, she, he should turn left, then he should turn right, and that's it. No, that's not the case, because turn left only turns the person uh, in the same spot. So if I turn left and if I turn right, he's in the same exact position he was before. I want to turn left and then advance, move forward, so he goes in the north, right? So. I will move forward, I will turn left, and then I'll move forward again. This will make the person move forward, turn left, and then go up. And now we are able to solve the whole maze, because from here he wants to turn right, and he wants to move forward, and after resetting the problem, we should be in the goal. That's it. So, what should we do? That's the piece of code. Move forward, turn left, move forward, turn right, move forward, and that's it. Uh, here there is a new kind of block which is this green block here and well the tooltips already tell you what this is about. This is a block that allows us to repeat an action multiple times. In this case it will repeat an action until the guy reaches the goal. And the thing that you want to repeat is probably something that you have to put inside this hole. This is the only block you see that has a hole inside. So instead of stacking this block on top or below, 
well you cannot even put this below uh, on top you just you can just put it below but since it has a hole probably if you want to repeat things you have to put them inside of this loop block it's a loop block uh, why do you need a, a loop block well this guy could move forward once twice oh i've uh, I run out of blocks. This is a special maze in which I can only use two blocks. And that's a bummer, because if I had probably four or five move forward blocks, I could just tuck them one on top of the other and the guy would reach the goal. But I only have two blocks uh, available. So how can I solve this? Well, I'm forced to use this repeat block. If I wrap the move forward block, inside of a loop of a repeat block then this move forward block will be repeated until the guy reaches the goal let's see if it works i reset and run the program again you see he's moving forward again and again and again until he hasn't reached the goal and this is the corresponding javascript code pretty pretty straightforward while it's not done move forward of course, I'm not explaining you the syntax, the JavaScript syntax. I'm going to explain it to you later on. But you can find it pretty uh, understandable, uh, apart from the curly braces, the parentheses, and uh, everything else. But still, it looks a bit like human readable code. While not done, move forward. Let's go to this maze. This is a beautiful maze because if you try to look at it from scratch, you probably are have to think about it a little more. But this maze looks a lot like maze 2, in which we had the zigzag pattern, right? We had that zigzag pattern and we already know how to solve that zigzag pattern. In fact, we can move forward, turn left, move forward, turn right. This was the thing that we already did on, uh, on maze 2. And what happens if I do this sequence of four steps? He moves forward, turns left, moves forward, turn right. Now I'm in the same situation I was before, but I'm one step ahead. So if I repeat the sequence of four steps another time, I will, I will be here. And if I repeat it again, I will be here. And finally, I will reach the goal. So what I can do is to wrap the whole sequence of four steps inside a code block that says repeat all of it and now the maze will be solved because i'm doing these four steps again and again and again until i reach the the the, the end of the maze the goal uh, this could have been difficult for some of you because in the previous maze you saw that you can put one block inside of this loop block and nobody told you that you can put multiple blocks inside of this, of this loop block. But try to experiment and you will find that you can. So you should. Okay. Uh, I'm going to run the program again. So far so good. I don't see any uh, comments here. Uh, which probably means that everybody, everything is clear or nothing is clear at all. Or the stream was uh, interrupted again, which is even worse. Let me check on Slack. Everybody's fine. Okay, okay. Okay, so this was maze 4. Let's go with maze 5. Maze 5 is another really cool example of uh, maze because it is an example of how you can split a problem into two smaller problems. You can solve them independently and then you can combine those solutions together in order to solve the maze. What, I'm what am I talking about? Well, this guy should go forward a couple of steps, then he should turn left, and then he should, should move forward until he reaches the goal. Okay? So, moving forward until you reach the goal, you, you already know how to do that. You repeat the move forward until you reach the goal. So, this kind of uh, block is the solution to the second part of the problem. What about the first part? Well, he has to move forward a couple of times, so I can stack two move forward blocks here. And then he should turn left in order to position himself in the, in the route that will lead him to the goal. So this three blocks, this stack, solves the first problem. Move forward twice until you reach the corner and then turn left so you're facing north. This other piece, this other stack, 
is solving another piece of the problem, which is starting from here, just move forward until you reach the goal. Now I just need to stack those two solutions together and he will move forward twice, turn left and then continue all the way until he reaches the goal. So you, as you can see, we started splitting the problems, the problem into two different subproblems. We tried to solve them independently. We didn't care about the rest of the problem. We just tried to focus on one piece of the problem. And it was much easier to, to, to solve that problem since it was confined in a smaller space. And once we combine all the solutions, we have the overall solution to this problem. Okay. What else? Okay, we have this guy that wants to go forward and then turn left and then turn left again. He always turns left. He's not, he's never turning right. And we also have another kind of block. This is a conditional block because I can say if there's a path to the left or to the right or ahead, then do something. So what should I do here? I could probably say something like uh, if there is a path to the left, then turn left. So I'm putting myself in the shoes of this guy. If I'm here on the corner, I know that there's a path on the left, so I want to go left. Otherwise, I'm not going to the left, I'm just going straight. So in any case, I will probably then move forward. And I'm going to repeat all of this until I reach the goal. So this should probably work like this. The guy is checking if there's a path on the left. There's no path on the left, so this uh, if block will never be executed and he will move forward. After moving forward once, he will still check if there's a path on the left. There's no path on the left, so he will skip this uh, blue block and just move forward, which is the, always the same thing that he is going to do at every iteration of this cycle. But then at a certain point, he will reach this corner here. And when he reaches this corner, there will be a path to the left, so he will turn left and then he will move forward. And this should work for all the corners that we see here. So let's see. You see how he's checking? Now, finally, he's, he finds a corner on the left, so he really turns left. That's the, the moment in which he turns left again. And there we are. Here we are. Is there any other solution? Yes, there is one, which is kind of stupid, but we can, for example, move forward before turning left. I think this is uh, exactly the same, but we are sparing one extra check because we don't care about checking immediately. We can do a step forward and then check, do a step forward and then check. What happens if I do like this? Everything is exactly the same, but I had one step left um, because I'm not doing the first check. I'm skipping the first check. I'm starting to move forward and then I will check. Another thing is that uh, probably these steps are all multiples of two. So since I, only, I still have one block left, maybe I can even make the guy go faster by saying, hey, move twice every time because there's no need to check at every step. There's a need to check at every two steps. Let's see if this works. Two steps and check, two steps and check, two steps and check. The guy is going a little faster than before. Hope it works, yeah, it works. So what did we do now? We solved the maze in a different way. We used more blocks but the code was a little more efficient because the guy uh, went two steps before checking, which made the guy go a little faster than before. So is this a better solution? I don't know. It depends. It depends on uh, the, the metrics that you want to use. If you want the guy to go faster, yeah, this is the best solution. But if you want to use less blocks, then this is not the best solution. The best solution was probably the one with just one move forward, such as this one, because it uses one less block. So there's never a best solution uh, in, in an absolute way. There's always a, a more useful solution according to your needs. Uh, my need could be I want to use 
less uh, fewer blocks as possible or my needs could be I want to make the guy move as fast as possible now on to May 7 what can I do I want this guy to always go on the right probably it would be better to make him go on the right so if I can always use this uh, this code block that says if there's a path on the right and we can try if there's a path to the right then go right otherwise you can move just forward and probably even do it twice let's see what happens I'm probably mistaken this is if this works it's exactly the same thing as before but he's going on the right instead of on the left okay please turn right now yep it just worked so that was pretty straightforward and very similar to maze number six maze number eight now this guy wants to go left but also right and i cannot use that trick of moving forward twice because there's this zigzag pattern that forces me to move forward just once so if i continue doing this uh, double move forward uh, trick I, it will probably work here in which the steps are always a multiple of two but it will start not working here so I will get stuck so here I can say if there is a path on the left go left if there is a path on the right then go right and in any case just move forward because I still want this guy to advance and I'm gonna repeat everything I don't know if this works but let's see okay so far so good are you still there with me can you shout out in the chat or maybe you are already doing it and I'm not receiving anything no okay seems like it's working and it's working we've used uh, not all the blocks that were available okay thanks Jabata Sam thank you Esther I'm going a little fast in here. Um, the reason is that, uh, well, most of you should have done these mazes and shouldn't have, uh, have any problems with mazes up to nine. You probably had lots of problems with maze number 10, which is fine. In fact, I even put it on the slides that you should do mazes one to nine. You're not supposed to do number 10 since it's uh, an advanced one. If you have any problems understanding this the cool thing is that well in my experience these mazes uh, well if I show you the solution I'm going to spoil you the game but usually these solutions are complicated enough so you will forget about them and you can try later on again and again in fact this is what happened to me for maze number 10 for maze number 10 I tried a solution I finally came up with a solution then I removed the solution and I tried again and I didn't have memory of what I did so I had to recreate it again and again and again but most of the times it's not like that most of the times if you know the solution to a puzzle then you cannot unlearn it and the game will be spoiled to you so probably the reason why I'm going a little fast in here is that if some of you haven't even tried the mazes and want to try by yourselves then I'm going fast so you're not understanding everything and you can still try by yourselves Esther says once I've understood the logic of the exercise I've done them very quickly that's awesome which means that you already have the proper mindset and that's good news uh, watch out because this means that you have talent and the talent itself uh, will not be sufficient we need talent yes a little bit but mostly hard work some talented people relax too much and uh, find things to be too easy for them and then at a certain point they will bang the head on a wall because there will be um, a problem which is much more difficult than expected so let's stay humble some of us are really talented but there will be challenges for you guys but for now kudos on uh, solving these problems 
okay, this guy wants to go left, then I would probably want him to go left here, then continue uh, avoiding this uh, left turn here. Then I want him to go left here and then go straight, ignoring any kind of uh, left or right turn. So, as you can see, he only wants to go left or straight, never on the right. And uh, I would like him to go left only if there's no other choice. So, for example, here I want him to go left because he cannot go straight and he cannot go right. And here it's the same. He wants to go left because there's no other choice. But here he's got a choice to go left or to go straight. And in that case, I want him to go straight. Here he has the same chance. He can go straight or to the left. And I want to go him. I don't want him to go straight because I don't want him to wander around. I want him to go straight to the point. So I'm saying something like, if there is a path on the left, but there's also a path ahead, then I want to prefer the guy to go ahead instead of left. And if there is a path to the left, but there's no path ahead, then I will just go left. As you can see, we are now using another kind of block, which is the if-else. So, uh, the difference with the if block is that here we can specify what to do if such condition applies and what to do if that condition does not apply. All these blocks are really, really important because we will find them while coding. We will write them as if and else blocks. We will not use any, any more of these uh, colorful blocks. We will write real code. But the logic is exactly the same. In fact, as you could see, every time you finish a maze, you will see the corresponding JavaScript code. So, if there is a path to the left, then I want to choose. If there is a path ahead, then I will just ignore the path to the left and move forward, like in this case, or in this case, or in this case. But if there's a path on the left and there is no path ahead, then I will just turn left, just like here or here. I want to turn left. And what if there's no path to the left? Uh, is there such a thing? Yes, probably here, for example, because here I'm, I have to just go straight and there's no path to, path to the left. So in that case, I just want to move forward. And I, don't never, I never want to go on the right. I repeat everything until I reach the goal. And let's see if this works. Probably not. And if it doesn't work, I will ask you for help. Okay. Now please advance. Please go. Yes. Yes. And it worked. Okay. And I still have even one block spare that I don't care about. And this is the corresponding JavaScript code. There's a while block with an if and an else and blah, blah, blah. And we will see this later when we, uh, we are learning JavaScript. Finally, maze 10. So about maze 10, I saw a couple of people uh, trying and succeeding. For example, PNTM solved the maze using all the blocks and he did a really cool thing. He didn't show the solution. So thanks PNTM for caring uh, to not spoil the solution to us. He just showed that he used all the blocks and in fact, the guy reached the goal. That's awesome. But PNTM also says there must be a way to get less than 10 code blocks, right? And yes. Uh, so Hybe, one of my best former students, said, yes, you can do it with six blocks. He, he could with six blocks. And uh, Bobby also said, yeah, you can go with, and he showed the corresponding JavaScript code, which is another cool move because it doesn't really spoil the, the problem to anybody who wants to try themselves. So I'm going to show you both the solutions or similar solutions. And if I refresh the page, I can even have a look at this tooltip. Can you solve this complicated maze? Try following the left-hand wall, advanced programmers only. What does it mean, the left-hand wall? Well, you probably know that in real life, if you want to escape any kind of maze, you just need to follow the leftmost wall or the rightmost wall if you want, and eventually you will go to the exit. And this is the same situation. If I want this guy to escape the maze, I can try to plan a route, the fastest route maybe, which is what I'm going to do. But I can also try to corner 
the left wall or the right wall and this guy will do a very long path but eventually he will reach the goal for example he can go straight always having a left wall on the on the left then he can turn left then he will go left then he will be forced to go right here okay that's fine but still sticking on the left wall and he will do all the path round and he will go back to here he will get stuck in here but then he will go outside of here then he'll go always facing left always going left and finally he will reach the goal so we're only seeing pineapples <laughs> what does it mean are you saying that you're just what okay when did it happen why did oh i see why it happened i'm sorry i'm so sorry guys because i tried to press f5 in order to refresh this page and f5 was a shortcut for a few moments later so lesson learned i'm sorry it will never happen again hopefully okay sorry guys so i was talking about maze number 10 and i really thought i thought it wasn't purpose <laughs> no it wasn't <laughs> okay so i'm gonna i'm going back to the maze 10 we are here on maze 10 and maze 10 we can solve it in two ways one is trying to go straight to the point which is something that i will do and one is instead trying to always face a left wall so i'm going here 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 going around this circle then go here get stuck in here then go here and here here and finally here okay it's facing the leftmost wall we can also do the same thing on the right so he will try to go on the right get stuck here go back then face always right get stuck here go back go here on the right go here on the right get stuck and finally go here okay this is and you are seeing this right now okay this is one of the approaches in fact it's the approach that is suggested by the same blockly games tooltip so how do you do this uh, the solution is you turn left and you move forward whenever you find a path on the left so if there is a path on the left you go left and you do a step forward and what if you don't have a path on the right on the left then you have to choose if there's a path on the right or if there's a path ahead you have to do a lot of things but as uh, bobby found out i think it was bobby let me check again uh yes as bobby found out there is a trick to this which is if there is no path to the left you can create one in fact for example if i am here if the guy is there facing on the right there's no path on the right uh, on the uh, ahead uh, sorry there's no path on the left so one thing that i can do is i can turn right now there is a path on the left let me show you if there is if i turn right now uh, the respect to him there is a path on the left so he's going to turn left and go ahead so this is a pretty cool trick that allows you to solve the problem with uh, very few blocks so this is what we are going to do if there is a path on the left then go left and move forward if there is no path on the left then create yourself a path on the left by turning right so this is how it's going to work you see, he's always doing this extra step of turning right just to have a path on the left. And he will take a long, long time because he's going to go all around the maze. Yes, that is a pro move. And I would probably never come up with myself. The le this level is extremely difficult, says Blockly Game. Would you like to skip it and go on to the next game? You can always come back later. No, thank you. I'm solving the problem. Why should I go to the next game? this is uh he's not trusting me so okay he's going really 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 slow but as you can see he's doing exactly the same plan that i showed you before is there another way for the shortest route instead of least blocks yes there is and in fact as soon as this guy reaches the goal i'm gonna show you that other 
uh, that other plan. Yay! We found it, and with very few blocks. How many blocks? One, two, three, four, five. So, so Hype said that there was a solution with six blocks, but apparently we found a solution with five blocks, which is uh, awesome. And from a blocks point of view, this is probably the opt optimal solution. I couldn't find a, a better solution than this one. It's really, really strange as a solution because there's this thing about if there's no path on the left, then make a, a, a path on the left by yourself by turning right. This is really strange. You're flattered, Bobby. You should be. <laughs> but now I'm going to show you another kind of optimal solution because I don't want this guy to wander around so much. I want this guy to just go straight to the point. Is there a way to do that given the limited blocks that we have? Let's try. So this is where things get really really tricky and i myself found yesterday night uh, a way to make sense of the code that i'm going to write so i will pr probably try to explain this thing to you by writing a couple of things on a on a text file so don't worry this is no code this is not Blah, blah, blah. Is it big enough? Yeah, probably so. Okay, so I want to solve this problem by having the shortest route. So I will try for any kind of corner that this guy find, finds to decide what he should do. For example, in this corner, he's got a path ahead and a path on the right and the left. And in that case, I want him to go left right? On this corner, he's got a path on the left, ahead and on the right. And in that case, I want him to go right. So this is a different situation. Here, I didn't have a path on the right and I decided to go left. Here, I have both, not both. Here, I have at the same time left, ahead and right, and I decide to go right. Here, the situation is exactly the same as the first corner. I have a path ahead and a path on the left. I want to go left. Here, I've got a different situation. I've got a path on the left and one on the right, no paths ahead, and in that case, I want to go left. And finally, here, I only have a path on the right, no paths ahead, no path on the left, and I want to go right. Makes sense for now? Hope it is, hope it does. Now, I'm trying to rationalize all of this by creating some sort of table in which I uh, take into account every possible solution. And I'm going to build this table in some pseudocode, but I can do it with a paper and pen, that's fine. I can say, if there is a path on the right, so I'm, put an, I'm putting an R to say there is a path on the right, and there is a path on the left, so I'm putting an L, and there is a path ahead, so I'm putting an A, uh, I'm going to do a pipe symbol as a separator. So if these three conditions apply, there is a path on the right, there is a path on the left, there is a path ahead, what should I do? Well, this is exactly the situation we have in this corner here. We have, we have all the three together. There is a path on the right, there is a path on the left, there is a path ahead, I want to go right. So this is how I'm going to note it. I want to go right, okay? Right, left and ahead, I want to go right. And then we can say there is a path ahead, there is a path on the left, but there's no path ahead, and I'm going to note it uh, just for fun, like minus A, which probably means no A, no paths ahead. So is there a case in which there's a path on the right and a path on the left, but no path ahead? Yes, it's this corner here. And in this case, as you can see, I want this guy to go left so he can, re he can be closer to the goal. So I will say, then in that case, go left. We're getting really uh, theoretical here, yeah? We're getting really abstract. And this is the coolness of maths. And this is actually a very important branch of maths, which is called Boolean logic. And the cool thing about Boolean logic is, just like every kind of math, you can formalize a problem into symbols. And at first, symbols can be 
worrying, can be frightening, but if you can handle those symbols, you can completely abstract from the meaning of what you're doing, you can solve some sort of uh, equation, and then you can give back meaning to those symbols and you have everything solved. So, for example, in this case, I can see that I can fill this table with all the possible permutations of these three variables, right, left, and ahead. What does it mean, permutations? Well, it means that we can combine all the possible values. There is a path on the right, or there is not a path on the right. There is a path on the left, or there is not a path on the left. There is a path ahead, there is not a path ahead. How many combinations can we find? Well, if you do the maths, you should find that it's two to the power of three combinations, which is eight. But if you don't want to do the math, then let's just try to uh, list them all one by one. So here we've got R and L and A changes from A and not A. Then we can do R but no L. And in that case, we can have A and not A. So we now change the value of L and we change the possible outcomes of A and we will reason about them. And finally, we can have not R with all their possible combinations. So, oops, sorry, if there's no path on the left, but there is a path on, uh, no path on the right, but there is a path on the left and a path ahead, no path on the right, there is a path on the left and there's no path ahead. And finally, the last combination that I can find is something like this. So no path on the right, no path on the left, and I'm juggling with the, the truthiness or falsiness of having a path ahead. I didn't, I, I'm not thinking about the meaning of these variables. I try, just try to list all the possible combinations that we can have, okay? So this is just like flipping three coins. If one coin says heads, and one other coin says heads, and the other coin says heads, then I have to decide what to do. If uh, the first two coins say heads and one says tails, then I have to decide what to do, etc., etc. And now, I, now that I listed all the possible solutions, I can reason about them. Is, is this already too daunting for you? Just be honest. Don't worry. Or are you following me so far? You're not supposed to understand completely all of this. Don't be frightened by all of this. This is already um, a, a very complex problem and we are already starting to find a quite complex solution that is actually re really, really similar to, to actual coding. Okay, so Bebas Coder says tutto bene, which means all well. Thanks for the Italian. Okay, so we said that if there's a path on the right, a path on the left, and a path ahead, we want to go right. Why? Because there's this kind of crossing here that has the same, this exact situation. There is a path on the right, one on the left, one ahead, and we want to go right. But if there is a path on the right, one on the left, and no path ahead, then we will want to go left. And it's the case of this crossing here. Then, is there this kind of thing? If there's, is there a path on the right, one ahead, but not a path on the left? Uh, I don't think so. We don't really care about this situation. There's this guy in this maze will never face a situation in which he finds a path on the right, a path ahead, but no path on the left. So you know what? I'm going to put a question mark. I don't care. Uh, it's how you want to go. PNTM says, for me, no problem so far. Nice. Okay, what about this? There is a path on the right, but there's no path on the left and no paths ahead. Is there any kind of situation here that is exactly like this? Yes, it's this corner here. When he faces this corner, he just has a path on the right and no paths on the left and no paths ahead. And in that case, of course, he wants to go right. So I'm going to say go right. Now, for uh, this uh, block here, is all about not having any paths on the right. So, there is a path on the left and there is a path ahead. What should I do? Well, 
This is a situation in which I have a path ahead and a path on the left and no paths on the right. So in that case, I want to go left. And the same goes with this. You remember, these are two very similar situations. So if there's a path on the left, a path ahead and no path on the right, I want to go left. If there is just one path on the left and no other paths here, then what should I do? Well, there is no such situation in here. So we actually don't care. Uh, there's never only a path on the left and never a path on the right. Yes, actually, there is one. It's here. But we don't want the guy to get inside of there. So we don't really care about this specific corner. What about having a path ahead and no paths on the left nor on the right? Which is exactly what is happening here. As, uh, as the guy starts, he only has a path ahead and doesn't have a path on the right and not a path on the left. So, of course, he wants to go ahead, but does it really matter if we use the same uh, kind of code that we did so far in which we always try to move ahead? Let's put ahead and see what happens. And finally, the last situation is I have no paths ahead, I have no paths on the right, I have no paths on the left. So what should I do? I cannot go anywhere. Well, this kind of situation is the typical situation you have, for example, here, when you're stuck. You don't have a path ahead of you on the left and on the right. So the only thing you can do is turn 180 degrees and go back. But this is not a situation we will ever incur because we want to plan the perfect path in which the guy will never be stuck. So we don't care about this situation, okay? so. This that we created here is called a truth table and it's the usual uh, tool that we use in Boolean logic in order to understand better uh, our problem, a logical problem and try to give a solution. I'm going to make it a little smaller here so blocks will be easy to see. So, now that we have this truth table, we can translate the table into code. How are we going to do this? So, we have a path on the right, but we also have a path on the left, and we also have a path ahead, which means that I can use multiple if-else blocks by saying, if there is a path on the right, then, if there is a path on the left, then, if there is also a path ahead, Okay, then in that case, I know I want to go right. And what I created here, this uh, architecture, is the same as this first line. Because I'm saying, if there's a path on the right, then if there's a path on the left, then if there's a path ahead, then I decide to go right. If uh, there's a path on the right and the path on the left, but this if is not true, because there's no path ahead, the, ta the truth table says that I should go left and I'm, I don't know what I'm creating. I'm just following blindly the truth table that I created. I'm abstracting away from the real meaning of the problem because I don't care. I formalize the problem, I formalize the solution and I don't really need to care what I'm doing. It will just solve by itself now. What if I have a path on the right, no paths on the left, and a path ahead? So this goes into probably the else part, because I have a path to the right, but I have no path to the left, so I'm going to the else part. And in that case, I still need to check if I have a path ahead or not. If I have a path ahead, I don't really care. This is the question mark that I have here. But if I don't have a path ahead, I want to go right. And this is where I can optimize my code a little bit, because I'm running out of blocks. If I don't really care about having a path ahead or not, I just want to go right, then, you know what, I'm just going to say, in any case, go right. Which means that, yes, I don't care about uh, having path on the right, pathing on ahead and no left, but I will stick with right, which is the same case that I have in the uh, subsequent line. Okay, so just turn light. Don't do any extra checks. If there is a path on the right and no path on the left, whatever is the path ahead, it is, there is one, there is not one, I'll just go right. I don't care. Okay, and finally we have this other piece 
that we have to deal with. There's no path on the right, but there is a path on the left and there is a path ahead. So I need to put a, another block that checks if there's a path on the left. And here too, actually, if there is a path ahead or if there's no path ahead, I don't really care. I'm just going on the left. So it's probably good if I just put this here, regardless of what is happening in this case. I don't care. It will never show up. So I'll just go left. If there is a path, there's no path on the right, there's no path on the left. Uh, wait a second, there's a, can we leave it open to save it even more blocks? Leave the else open, I mean. Yes, you're probably right. Um, we don't have a path to the right. We don't have a path to the left. This is what happens here. And, and this is a strange case because, well, if there's no path, not even on the ahead, left or right, we don't really care about it. And if there's a path ahead, we just need to go ahead or we can just say, do nothing, because I will still go ahead at a certain point. So yes, you're right. I can still say, if there's a path on the left, just go left. I don't care about anything else. The only thing I care about is, in any case, once you've decided where to go, just move forward and repeat everything until you reach the goal. Let's see if this works. I'm not really sure. Okay, moving forward, checking moving forward, checking. Every time he checks if the truth table was implemented correctly, he's doing the proper decision in order to get to the right spot. I really hope it works. And it worked! How difficult was that? <laughs> it was super difficult. I can assure you that yesterday night I tried multiple times recreating the truth table and uh, recreating this uh, stack of blocks and I always failed. So the reason why this worked at first, on the first try, is just that I practiced so much that I probably narrowed the possible, uh, the probabilities of, uh, of not solving it. Is there anybody writing here? No, everything is fine. Okay, so that was really, really complex. And I'm not expecting you guys to, uh, to, to solve these pro complex problems right now. But as you can see, this was probably a good example of how you can formalize a problem, uh, make it a little abstract, solve the equations and have a, everything solved. Uh, for you by the power of maths and logic, okay? So if you want, you can go back to this problem. I'm pretty sure that other, unless you are screenshotting the solution, you will not, uh, you will not, um, um, oh my God, you will not memorize it. Uh, so you can uh, still uh, try it again by yourselves. That was really, really hard. And in fact, it's so hard that if you notice, sometimes I, I, I looked uh, down at my crotch because I have a sheet of paper in which I noted the overall solution, the overall truth table at least, because otherwise I was not really, really sure that uh, I could have been able to, to find the solution live with you guys. But still, finally we found the solution of maze 10. Don't be scared, really. Don't be scared. This will all come up at the end. I'm really much more scared about the five block solutions, actually, because that is really, really a, a creative way to solve the, the, the maze. And I probably couldn't ever come up with that. I solved this thing with a, with a, with a tool that I know already, the truth table, but I would probably never come up with uh, if there's no path on the left, just create it yourself by, by turning right. I screenshotted my solution to hang in the wall of inefficiency. <laughs> no, BNTM, that's awesome. That was a, that is a, was a really cool solution still. And it's actually quite efficient since we found the solution in the least amount of steps, uh, the most direct way. By the way, is this the best solution now since we are more direct? Well, from a point of view of efficiency, yes, the guy didn't wander around and he reached the goal in the least amount of steps, probably. 
So yeah, from a performance point of view, this is probably the best solution. But if you remember the other solution, which I'm going to state again here, I'm going to repeat the fact that if there's a path on the left, uh, then turn left and move forward. I'm doing this by memory, of course. I'm not going to, I'm not thinking about this solution. Well, this solution has two advantages. First of all, it uses less blocks, which is not a real advantage because, well, we don't care about how many blocks we want to use. But yeah, if we care about this, it's still a better solution than the one, the last one that I proposed. But the best thing about this solution is that it's generic. So if you have any kind of maze, you will apply the solution and it will always work. Instead, the solution, the complex solution that I showed you before, will only work for the particular maze that we had at hand and will fail miserably with uh, any other kind of maze. So this is a more generic approach. It's a shorter piece of code, it's more generic, it's less efficient, but still, it has its really cool advantages, right? So we always need to think about the solutions and uh, what they mean to us. There's never a best solution. There's a more useful solution or a less useful solution based on the problem that we are facing. Okay, and that's it for Blockly games. Now, the last game that I proposed to you guys was typing.io. You can sign in with Google, but I usually just try the demo. And I already showed you last time what it means. Uh, Bobby Jabata says, yeah, call me generic now after you said it's clever. Generic is synonym of clever, <laughs> probably. Yeah, you, well, you will probably see during this course that we will always look for the most generic ways to solve a, problems, uh, a problem, because a generic solution is a solution that you can reuse, and we want to build reusable software. We want to write software that doesn't solve only this problem, but that can solve any kind of problems. So your solution will become the building block of many other solutions. And this is the beauty of software engineering. We're not just solving a, a problem. We're trying to solve any kind of problems, problems that we can come up with right now, but also problems that we never faced before. We just build the right building blocks, just like with Lego, and then you will build amazing things with those building blocks, given that those building blocks work and are uh, generic enough. Aren't we doing the bird? It was a real pain. Yes, it was. And we will do it uh, another time. Uh, I don't want to, to go in detail on the bird thing right now because uh, it's still uh, something about coding. I would like you guys to try again maybe during this week um, and maybe interact on Slack. If you're stuck with one of the bird mazes, then you can probably do as PNTM and, uh, and Bobby did. So screenshotting the problem, screenshotting your solution, and uh, we can try to think together about how to solve that specific maze. Okay, but I'm not going to do this uh, today, right now, because otherwise we'll not go uh, to, the, to the meat of this course. This not, is not a course about Blockly games. This is a course about programming. So we dealt with uh, a, a task that is, um, it is really important to understand how to solve problems without any coding. This other game is all about coding without solving any problems because it's blindly coding things that we don't even understand. So I showed you already that in the JavaScript jQuery you start typing and I'm doing a mess immediately. And I already said that I'm not really good at this game, especially when I'm writing, uh, I'm speaking while writing code. Uh, I think I'm gonna stop right here because I want to waste another minute and a half of your time by embarrassing myself. Okay, so we don't care about this, but I also told you that I have a secret magic plan that allows me to solve this problem in an unbeatable score. You will never be able to beat me. I don't know if you tried. You can try and try again. You will never be able to beat me. And how do I do that? Well, it's very simple. I click on this uh, magic button 
And as soon as I click on this magic button, the problem is solved. There were 305 typo characters. I typed 305 characters and I took zero seconds. I took, well, I wrote zero words per minute, but my accuracy was perfect. So this is the best any human can possibly do. In fact, it's not even human, of course. I scored an inhuman score. And how do I score an inhuman score? Well, I leave everything to the machine. So this uh, magic link is something that I came up myself because I wanted to cheat the system and I didn't want to do this by myself. I left the task to the machine. If you want to see what this magic is about, you will probably not understand all of it and that's fine. Um, I'm going to show you probably, no, it's better if I show you in, uh, on, on GitHub directly. Uh, so I'm going to in Glorious Coders, uh, don't worry, I'm going to tell you what this is. In Glo, what is that? I don't remember if it's in Glorious Academy or, um, in Glorious Academy. So this is one attempt, which works, but it's really, really ugly. This kind of code is what makes the problem solve itself, itself without human intervention. Uh, if you don't know any coding, you will find this really difficult to understand. If you do any coding, you'll find it extremely difficult to understand. Because this is, on purpose, a very obscure piece of code. And this is the kind of code that solves the problem, but it has no other perks. It has no other advantages. The, there is an old saying that says, that quotes, every fool is able to write code that a machine can understand, but only few people are able to write code that a human can understand. So we will see as soon as we can that this kind of solution, yes, it works, but it's crap. It's not good code, because it's code that I write, I can understand it the moment I write it, but as soon as I, I let someone else read this code, they will not be able to understand it. And even myself, if I look at this code six months from now, I will never be able to understand it. So that's quite stupid for me to write code like this. Some people, find themselves really smart because they write code that other humans are not able to understand. They feel smarter than everybody else because they have this uh, fine brain that nobody is able to understand. That's not true. That's not really true. It's really, really easy to, re to write crappy code. It's really a craft, a work of creativity and craftsmanship to write code that is easy to read. So this is another alternative that I'm not saying it will be easy for those who don't know coding to read, but probably it will be a little more understandable even for those who don't know any coding. In fact, it starts with uh, an English word, uh, an English sentence, solve by cheating. So from the start, you know what this code is about. It's going to solve the typing.io game by cheating. And how do you cheat? Well, there is a function called with the same name that says get hidden input field from page. So apparently in the page of typing.io, there is a hidden input field and I can get this input field and type things inside of that input field. And I can also get the code from the page, which probably is pretty understandable. It just means that I'm going to get all this kind of code from the page so I can retrieve the code character by character and type every character inside that hidden input field. And in fact, the third line of this is fake user input. So how do I solve typing.io by cheating? I take two things. I get the code from the page. I get this uh, kind of input field that was hidden from us. And apparently it works like that. And for every character I find in the code, I will input that character in the input field. 
and uh, it will type as fast as a machine can do. And then we can go into the details of how do you get the input in field from the page or how do you get the code from the page, but we don't care too much about that. If we want to know the solution from a high level, we can stop on the first, first line or first seven lines and that's fine. If we want to go deeper, we can go deeper. We can read the code uh, uh, along and we will see that the code is much longer. It's uh, 84 lines of code uh, compared to the, I don't remember, 19 lines of code. But still, yes, it is more verbose, but it's a lot more understandable, at least by those who know a little bit of coding. And this is what we are going to focus a lot on. We are not only doing a course on coding, this will be a course on good coding from the start. And this is probably one of the unique value propositions that I can give you uh, right here with this academy. I saw many tutorials that tell you how to write code, but I'm, I'm, I don't want only this. I, I want to start right away to make you write good code, code that you can use and you can write when you are in a business in the IT field. Uh, this is the superpower that I'm going to give you immediately from day one, not day zero, because day zero was last week, but from day one, yes. Okay, so we'll go back to this magic solution if you are curious about it. But as you can see, why should we learn JavaScript? Because JavaScript is a language that can be used for everything. It can even be used to hack games and websites, which is not something that I encourage you to do, but it just means that you can really do lots of things with JavaScript. Not everything, but lots of things, more than other languages. Okay, so finally, we can start the slides of today. And you will see that I'm not going to follow the slides too much. I'm going really uh, to improvise a little bit. But today we're starting to write code. So this will be our crash course. We will start by creating our first website and putting it online. And you will see how easy it is actually. And this will give you a full sense of confidence. You will probably believe that coding is actually pretty easy. Well, it's not, but this is a way to encourage you to at least start because coding is not easy but it's not even difficult. It's uh, how you approach it that matters. Uh, we will try to approach it in a creative and a fun and an engaging way. If it's not fun enough, if it's not engaging enough, just tell me and I will try to make it more fun, more engaging. Uh, it's all about creativity and uh, having fun and using uh, some creativity mixed with logic. So let's dive in. What are we going to do right now? We're going to follow a tutorial. Shouldn't we buy a domain in order to put it online? Uh, says uh, Jabata, which is Bobby. No, we, we really don't need to. We can uh, use some uh, hosting services, even free hosting services, that will put our website under their own domain. Then, if you want our own domain, for example, ingloriouscoders.com, IT, which is my domain, then yes, you have to buy that domain. But in order to just host your web application somewhere, you can start for free, completely for free, without buying any domain, just by accepting the fact that your website will be hosted by someone else under their own domain. So no worries about that. So what we're going to do is we're going to follow a very cool tutorial made by a Swiss friend of mine. Um, of course, completely free, very well done. I'm not going to follow it uh, step by step. I'm trying to put also my thing in it. But in this tutorial, we'll learn how to do some HTML coding and probably even some CSS coding. We are going to understand how to debug our code on the browser. We are learning how to style our code with some CSS rules. And we will understand how to publish our work online so everybody will be able to enjoy it. So I really hope that at the end of uh, this, of today's lesson, you will have something that you can show to your family and friends. Let's see. 
So if I click on the reference here, I will go to this website, which is codemakery.ch. And ch is the same, the, 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 how do you say that? Uh, the symbol of Switzerland, let's say. I'm sorry, uh, sometimes I don't find the proper words. And uh, this is what he's going to, 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 to create with you guys. I don't know if we are going so much in detail on that, but we're going to create a website that shows a portfolio with some, uh, um, with some headings, some paragraphs, some images, even some links, a navigation link toolbar in order to go to different pages of the website, the homepage, the blog, the projects, contact, etc., etc. We'll start really, really slow with just a few lines of code and then we can progress and make it uh, more and more complex, okay? Uh, I really encourage you, as soon as this lesson is over, to look at this website and read thoroughly anything he says because this is really, really well done, well written. And he, for example, tells you the difference between website, web application, what happens on the mobile. There's so many things that can really help you understand a little more about what we are doing. Uh, just uh, one, um, one note. Uh, usually, when I see this uh, kind of paging, I usually either click on... Uh, the one in order to go to chapter one, or usually I go to next in order to go to the next chapter. Uh, not in this case. In this website, I don't know why, if you go to next, this means next steps, which is a completely different tutorial. So don't click on next in order to advance uh, on the chapters of this tutorial, because it will not work. You can go here, there's always a link at the bottom of the page that says, start go next to go to the next chapter or just click on the number uh, in this paging toolbar so let's build our first website and as you can see marco this swiss friend of mine suggests immediately this editor called visual studio code i'm going to use visual studio code too but if you have any other editor that's fine i think that on windows notepad is really really too basic as an editor so if you can please try to install our uh, a little more advanced editor such as notepad plus plus for those who know it or visual studio code or uh, sublime text whatever you want uh, i think that visual studio code is pretty fine and probably now that i think about it we are also going to add an extension on the editor that will allow us to test our code um, directly on our browser without even publishing it online. Uh, it's still optional, but still, it would be better to have Visual Studio Code installed. I have it installed, so I will use Visual Studio Code. And as you have already seen, Visual Studio Code is just a text editor, but it's dark. And if you don't like dark, you can switch the theme to a lighter theme, but developers usually prefer darker themes because, well, the joke says that light attracts bugs, but the truth is that a dark theme is easier on your eyes. And since our job is staying on the computer eight hours a day, sometimes even more, it's much better to have a darker theme. Um, I can create a new file pretty easily. And uh, I usually use shortcuts. But if you have this file toolbar here, you can do new file. The shortcut is Control N, which is a usual um, usual shortcut that you can use even on browser to create a new tab. Control N or Command N on Mac creates a new untitled file. And here I can start writing things. And the first thing that I'm going to write is, of course, Hello World. And as I already mentioned, Hello World is the typical sentence that you, uh, you state whenever you're learning a new technology or new programming language. PNTM says, yeah, I agree, do the exercise on typing I.O. was quite tiring on my eyes. Mm, that's true. Okay, so I'm writing this uh, sentence, hello world. You can, of course, write whatever you want. And I'm going to save this file. So I'm going to save it by going to file, save, or save as, since we still haven't haven't given uh, a file name. Um, I like shortcuts 
because shortcuts allow me to be more productive by just using the keyboards and not using the, the mouse or the trackpad. So the usual shortcut for saving files is Control S or Command S on Mac. Control S and he says, okay, but where should I save this, uh, this file and what name should I give? So I'm going to, in a specific place of mine, you can put it on the desktop, on the documents, just to, uh, you can create your own folder, which could be nicer probably. Uh, if you, for example, go to documents and then create a new folder and you call it portfolio, port, Portfolio. Sorry, a little dyslexic here. Um, you can create a new folder called Portfolio and you will put everything you want inside of that folder. This will make us, uh, will make it really easier to then save that portfolio online. We will put it on GitHub. So you will, this will be your online portfolio. So we'll create this portfolio. We'll try as much as we can to keep it as tidy as possible. And that will be the thing that you will show to your recruit recruiters one day at the end of the academy or meet, meet in the meantime, I don't know. Um, as for me, I have a projects folder with all the projects that I did so far. I have also projects for my own sake. And I've got a folder called academy. And uh, you know what? I'm going to put it in the inglorious academy here where I'm going to create a folder called uh, Crash Course. I'm going to call it like this. Uh, I'm certain they will be amazed by the hello. <laughs> yes, they will. No, they will not. But the hello is still uh, uh, the first step. Then we will change the hello. It will become something completely different. So don't worry. No, they will not just see the hello. The hello is just our starting point. So folder name is Crash Course. And the name of this folder of this file is index all lowercase i n d e x all lowercase dot this is the file name then separated by a dot i will put the extension of the file and the extension of this file will be h t m l not h m t l which doesn't work it's h t m l if you want to remember it, it's pretty easy. You just need to know what it stands for. HTML stands for Hypertext Markup Language. So it's a markup, a markup language for hypertexts, which doesn't make sense. But it's just a language, a markup language, which means it's a, a language in which we can write text but also add some uh, strange symbols that add a little more to the usual text. And it's for hypertext, because in the beginning of the World Wide Web, the cool thing about web pages and documents was that you could create links that point to other documents, which was huge at that time. And it's Huge even now, just think about Wikipedia. In Wikipedia, you can read any article you want, and then just with a click of a link, you can bounce to another article and read the details of that article, and you can bounce back, or you can go even further. So that's the beauty of hypertext. It's not just text, it's hypertext, because it's text on steroids. It's text that or does more than simple text. It allows you even to go somewhere else following links. So it's index with no capital letters. Some people use capital I. That's not good, especially if you're on a Mac, because Macs are case insensitive and they will give you uh, some problems if you mess up with the, with the characters. So all lowercase index.html. I know that I'm pedantic, I will not be as pedantic later on, but at first, for this first file, I have to say this. Then I save the file, and this is my first file. Okay, this file can be opened with any kind of uh, editor, such as Visual Studio Code, like it is right now. The fact that it's uh, an HTML uh, shows because I see this uh, kind of symbol with the less than and greater than symbols um, uh, next to it, 
which is probably meaning that it is recognized as an, an, an HTML document. If you don't see this kind of uh, icon, it probably means that you misspelled the extension of the file. If you call it HMTL, for example, this will not be recognized as an HTML document. And the cool thing about HTML documents is that they can be read and written by every any kind of editor, and they can be read by any kind of web browser. So I'm going to open this file from the file manager, and I put it in projects, uh, in glorious coders, uh, where is that? And um, I have it in uh, the Academy and I have it in an Inglorious Academy crash course. That was a long, long path. Of course, your path could be much shorter and I encourage you to have shorter paths such as, I don't know, your user documents, your file <laughs> or your user your documents, portfolio, your file. And I can open this file. In fact, it's going to open by default with a web browser. And uh, my favorite web browser in this system is Chrome. So if I just double click on this file, it will open on Google Chrome. Or I can just right click and decide what to do with this file. The first choice will always be open with your browser. I'm going to do this right now. Click. Hey. So I'm going to zoom the text. And if you want to zoom the text too, it's just a control plus or control minus or command plus command minus on Mac. And this allows me to show you the text a little larger. But still, we already created our first document. It's not a properly formatted document, but it's an HTML document recognized by the browser. So it's already good. Okay, yay, we've got our first document. And as you can see, browsers do not only show web pages hosted on servers online, they can even show you files that are stored locally on your file system. In fact, look at the, uh, the, the address of this file. It's a file, <laughs> and this is the path of my file on the file system. So it is a file. The problem, with uh, working this way is that if I now change anything, for example, I put three exclamation marks and save the file, I will not see the changes on my web page unless I refresh the browser. This is not really bad, but still, it would be so nice if the browser could listen to the changes that I uh, put on my file and maybe update automatically. This is what usually a live server does. And this is the reason why on part one of this tutorial, Marco suggests us to add a cool extension on Visual Studio Code called live server, which is what we are going to do right now. But before that, is everything fine so far? Uh, don't say yes, say no on the chat if there's something that is not going well, if you have any kind of problems. I don't see anyone so far, which probably means that... How do I open this in Mac? Save the file as HTML, that's cool. Okay, so how do you open this file on a Mac? Um, we can try multiple ways, for example, the um, Visual Studio Code editor allows you to add folders like this. So you can uh, use this folder and have, have it like a, a file system that only shows the, the, the code that you want to, 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 to see. And uh, probably you can do something like open, you, you right click on the index and you do open containing folder. I don't know if there is one on Mac, it should be. If you do open containing folder, it should open the file manager on that folder and then you just double click on it and you should be able to see it. If you, this, I'm telling you this if you cannot find the right file on the file manager. Otherwise, you can open the file manager and you can just navigate until you find the index.html. Or you can try the search feature in order to find your index.html. And then you just double click. 
If you still have any problems, I can try to help you by using a virtualized Mac. But let's see if, um, if you find the, the proper way by yourself. If you don't, if you still have any problems, I'll try to help you a little more than that. Let's wait. If there, is there anybody else who has any problems with this uh, index.html and opening it on a browser in the meantime? Got it. Nice. Very well done. Very, very well done. Okay, so we were, we were saying that we would like a live server to watch for the changes that I put on the file and uh, will automatically refresh the page on the browser so I don't need to hit refresh every time. How do I do that? Well, there's this symbol here on Visual Studio Code called extensions. And here, this is a marketplace of all the extensions that you can install. I have, well, 12 extensions installed already, but there are so many other extensions available, recommended extensions, uh, etc. And you can search for an extension called Live Server. I have a problem with this extension, which is that I already installed it. So I'm going to uninstall it. So we'll have a... Oh, I also need to reload the, the editor. Okay. So I'm looking for Live Server on this uh, panel and I find Live Server by a Ritwick Day. And I can install the live server by just clicking on this button here or this button here. It's the same. Uh, you just click it and in a very short amount of time, it should install it immediately. Now that we have the live server, I can go back to the, uh, to the file and the file system, or the file explorer with this other icon, the first one. I don't know if you have the same thing, but don't worry. Just need to have the the, the, the file open. And if you have this file open, the index.html, you can now right click on it and there should be a new, um, a new text on this menu, which wasn't there before, and it's open with live server. There's also a shortcut, but it's quite difficult to achieve, Alt L, Alt O, so I'm not going to do that. I'm going to click on open with live server and there's something happening Two, two things happening right at the same time. The first thing that happened is something here below in Visual Studio Code because it started a live server on port 5500, whatever a port is. And it also said live reload is not possible without body or head tag. Okay, that's uh, important information that you probably didn't understand, but I did and I will explain it to you as soon as possible, so don't worry. So this, the, thing, the first thing that happened is something's happening on, the, on Visual Studio Code. And the other thing that happened, it automatically opened another browser window with my Hello World inside. And now the address in the browser window is different. It's not a file anymore. It's a series of strange numbers. 127.0.0.1 colon 55 oo slash index html bybascutter says sorry mac issues again don't have that option when right clicking okay so you don't have this option when right clicking and uh, you know what let me check i shouldn't show you this probably but i do have a mac it's not a real mac it's a virtual machine with a mac inside of it could you repeat that opening live server again? Yes, I will. And I will do it on Mac right now because this sh should probably work for everyone. So don't worry, stick with me. Let's see what happens on this Mac. I'm planning to buy a Mac, I swear. But uh, for now, I need to stick with uh, what I have. So this is my Mac. Welcome to my Mac. And uh, after the login, I should uh, already have Visual Studio Code installed. 
and I should have uh, everything I need in order to work exactly like you are working. So I'm going to open Visual Studio Code on my Mac. It probably will be quite slow, but th this could be even a, a feature, not a bug. Never mind, got it now. I didn't add the folder to the Explorer previously. Uh, you're right because I didn't tell you to do that. So that's also my fault. C Visual Studio Code is opening. There's a Flutter mobile app that I'm developing with some friends. And I want to close this thing. I don't know how to do this. I'm really bad with Macs. So you will see I'm, I'm not really, really good at, uh, at using this. Is this the proper thing? No. How do you remove this folder from the workspace? I don't know and I don't care. Okay, I'm going to add a folder to this workspace. I'm going to add the folder, a folder that I don't have yet. So I'm going to create it. I'm going to create it in the documents folder. This is really, really slow. Okay, I'm in the documents folder and I want to create a new folder here. Can I? Yeah, there's a new folder here and I'm going to call it portfolio. As always, I'm dyslexic here, so I'm not able to write portfolio from the start. I add this folder and now I have two folders available on the workspace, which means that now I can remove the first folder from the workspace. Okay, now that I have the folder in the workspace, I can create a new file in it. I can do index.html as the name. As you can see, I'm showing you a different way to create the same file. First, I did a control N, I created an empty file, I wrote something inside of it, and then with control S, I gave a name. Now, I'm starting from a different point of view. I'm starting from the folder, I'm creating a file giving immediately the name, and then I can write things inside of it. And now that I have the file, which is probably pretty the same file as you have. I don't know why it's not saved. It looks like it's not saved, but it should. It probably is saved, but it's still showing me this, uh, th this circle, which is a little frightening. But still, I can install the live server extension. And I will install it with just clicking on this button. I don't want to uh, to click on that other button because I want to show you that it's exactly the same thing. Uh, I would also like to try to make the text a little larger for you so it will be easier to, um, to see it. It's taking a long time installing the server, but that's fine. Okay, now I can go back to Live server, browser preview, integration, auto file back to random port and fixes. Okay, thanks. Whatever it means. Um, I can go back to the F Explorer and if I right click, I see open with live server. Work now, says Baby Bebas uh, Coder. Follow your steps with opening new folder. Okay, cool. If, you, if anybody has a, a similar issue, it probably means that you just need to close Visual Studio Code and reopen it. Or you just need to add the folder to the workspace because you usually see this option from this uh, workspace explorer. There's another thing that you can do, which is go to the footer here at the bottom and you can see there's go live. So if you click here, it's starting a live server and it's still working. So you can also do that without having the uh, file explorer. You can still go to the footer here on Visual Studio Code and click on go live and you will see it does exactly the same thing. In fact, it's now saying port 5500. And if you click again on this, you are shutting down the live server. And the server is now offline. So you can uh, fiddle around by starting and stopping the live server how many times you want. So as you can see, everything is now working. I think my Google Chrome crashed. Yeah, so I'm not going to use my Mac anymore. I hope it's, uh, it's sufficient for you guys because it's really, really suffering. But still, as you can see, once you know where to go, there's no difference between Windows, Mac and, and Linux. They're always the same. So I started my live server and the server is, has started on this address, which is 
127001 and the port which is 5500 whatever these two terms mean and then slash index html well i know this name this is the name of my file so it's not exactly the same path that i had before but it apparently it shows exactly the same thing will it work now when i change something in my code and save it will it actually show me the differences without refreshing the browser no it doesn't because as babus is saying in the chat live reload is not possible without body or head tag what does that mean i'm not going to tell you right now but stick with me and i'm going to tell you in a while so don't worry and but this is a warning message that's really important because it's saying it's giving me a hint on why this live reloading is actually not working because I'm trying live reload to make it work. In fact, I changed the amount of exclamation marks, but the amount of exclamation marks didn't change unless I refresh the browser. So live reloading, which is not having to refresh the browser every time, is not working. And why is it not working? Because as suggested by Visual Studio Code, it says body or head tags are not present and we will add them in a while. Stick with me. So, hello world is not real, really an HTML document. Uh, it is some text, but usually in an HTML document, we define a structure for the document. Every kind of document, let's think about a Word document, has usually some title, some paragraphs, some images, some links, or whatever, okay? So, if you want to create a title, you have to wrap the text of this title in some tags, so it becomes an HTML element. And what is a tag? Well, I'm going to write this thing and write it blindly with me for now. I'm going to put a less than symbol, then I write h1 all lowercase, even though uppercase is fine too. And then I'm going to put a greater than symbol. If you did exactly the same thing as I did, Visual Studio Code started writing code by himself. I didn't want to, but he did. And for some, this could be a nuisance. For some, this is very cool because Visual Studio Code allows you to be more productive by not making you write, well, obvious code, which is pretty obvious as soon as you understand what this code is about. I'm going to remove the, the auto-generated code. I started by saying just less than h1 greater than. This is called an opening tag. So an HTML element, and you will see what this is, is comprised of an opening tag and a closing tag and some content inside and some other attributes that we will see. H1 means heading level one. And uh, if you ever used Google Documents, you probably already heard about this term. In fact, I will, I will open Google Documents. Google Documents is a web application, so it's a, an application that I can use, just like Word, but I didn't have to install it, I'm using it right on the web, which is so cool. This is the beauty of web technologies, they allow you to write applications that you don't even need to install, you just browse to, to the, the right website and you start using it. So, if I want to write anything here, I can do it as normal text, or I can change as title, subtitle, but I also have heading 1, heading 2, heading 3. You see, Google Docs has this concept of different kinds of headings, and heading 1 is a huge title, heading 2 is a smaller title, heading 3 is an even smaller title. This can be achieved with code by using these tags. So H1 is opening a heading of level 1, which is the biggest title that we can have. So I can say big big title or i can even call it heading one so i remember what kind of uh, heading it, it, this is but the tag is not complete i need to close the tag and how do i close the tag well 
the syntax is really similar to the syntax that we already used. In fact, it's a less than, we can use h1 and close, but we need to also add a slash here. A slash right after the less than symbol and right before the h1. Not really nice to see, really difficult to misspell. In fact, some people could even probably not know the difference between a slash and a backslash. Well, the backslash will backlash. It's not going to work. In fact, if I put a backslash, you see that the H1 is not colored, so it's not recognized as a valid tag. Instead, with a forward slash, the H1 is properly recognized as a tag. So watch out, you must know the difference between a slash and a backslash. And the reason why I asked you to practice a little on typing IO is not because you have to be masters of speed and accuracy, but it's because you have to practice a little bit on where these special keywords are. Slashes, uh, curly braces, uh, the at symbol, the tilde symbol, etc, etc. The hat symbol, the carrot symbol, as you told me last time. So they are very important and you need, well, the less than and greater than symbols, of course, they are very important. So we've got this H1. This is not just a text anymore. This is an HTML element. And an HTML element has an opening tag, has a closing tag, and it can have some content inside, which can be text or can be other HTML elements. So it's, um, it's a tree structure, just like the file system structure. You can have folders that contain files or other folders containing other files and other folders. And this is exactly the same. It's a tree structure in which we have elements containing either nothing or text or containing other elements containing other elements or other text. And what if I refresh the browser right now? Not this one, but this one. Ooh, I see heading one, which is huge. Okay, this is my huge title. Please note that there's not just a heading one, there's also a heading two or a heading three. Actually, HTML allows up to six levels of heading, which is huge. You will never use it, but still, we can use them. And if you understood the gist, then you can try yourselves. You can do minus h2, close the tag, heading 2. And now you see how convenient it is, the fact that Visual Studio Code is automatically closing the tag. It's so, it, it's so boring to close the tag that Visual Studio Code is just doing it for us. So I will just need to care about opening the tag and the closing will be a matter of Visual Studio Code. So I'm going to add this h2, save the file, refresh the browser, and I see that the h heading 2 is a little smaller. Can there be more than one h1? This is a very good question and I'm not going to reply you yes or no, I'm going to reply let's try. So I'm going to copy and paste another Heading one, will this work? Yes, it does. Yes, you can have as many H1s, H2, H3s, etc. as you want. Uh, they are not unique per se. So yeah, you can use them. Ricardo has shared an image right now. Ricardo, your code is good. But you have problems. I'm not seeing the header probably. Um, okay, you know what? I'm going to create exactly the same code that you created. Oh, I see, I see. Okay, so you, say, you did hello world. And then you said h1 header1. And uh, the browser did not show the header as a header. It showed the tag itself. When I do this, oh, I, I even misspelled header, I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, but still, my situation is a little different. And the reason why I'm having a different result is probably because you didn't 
create this code inside of a file with an extension of HTML. So could you please check the complete file name? No way. No way. Pineapples again. <laughs> Thank you, guys. Oh, my God. I, I, I have to... Is the Twitch cut off again? No, I, I think you're still here with me, right? You are with me. The problem is that I have to restrain myself from pressing F5. Sorry, sorry, really sorry. I will probably remove the shortcut on uh, OBS, the streaming platform that triggers that uh, pineapples. I swear, it was, it's never going to happen again. I'm really sorry for that. I will do this during the, uh, during the coffee break, which is going to happen right now. But still, uh, please, Ricardo, I right click on the left. Okay. And this is good. And then you said uh, go live. Oh, selected copy path. Okay. Then paste in browser. Could you please paste the path in here too? No, 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 that's fine too. That's fine. But please copy the path in here too. So we are able to see what exactly your path is. Copy path and paste it here. Here it is. Oh. Almost there. Get an error message. <laughs> what? You're not able to copy the path anymore and paste it here? Just paste like this? Can't paste this in Slack. Hmm. Okay, this is quite strange. And uh, you think you, I think we can address this thing, you and I, while the others are doing a coffee break. And as soon as the coffee break is over, we can have a look at it all together. So everybody will be able to enjoy their coffee, except you, Ricardo, and I. <laughs> okay? If that's fine for you. So... Let's have a coffee break. 13.03, we'll be back in 13.18. Thanks, have a good coffee break. Bye.
15 minutes later. And we're back. Okay, so the coffee break, uh, in the end, uh, we could do it. We could do it, Ricardo and I, because the problem was actually pretty easy to fix. And the problem was that the name of his file, instead of being index.html, was actually hello world.mdoc, uh, which is not recognized as a valid HTML document by the browser. By the editor, yeah, the editor can digest pretty much anything, but the browser doesn't like files with extension mdoc. That's why I stress so much that they should be named with an extension of HTML. But then the problem that Ricardo had was that he was trying to rename the file and in this mask, even though the format was uh, stated as HTML here, but still the file was saved as mdoc. And I believe, probably, I can assume that you, Ricardo, were trying to just change what the selection has, which is just the name, but not the extension. So if you want to change both the name and the extension, you have to select all or completely remove all and then replace with index.html. I don't know if, um, if it works, but still, Ricardo was able to find another way to solve the problem, which was by just changing it, the, the file name manually. So I don't know if he did it from the file manager here or from Visual Studio Code, which is even easier. You can right click, rename, and it should uh, rename the file in place. As you can see, the, the selection was just about the name, but I want to change also the extension. So I'm gonna select all of it and then replace with any name that I see fit. In this case, it's index.html. And in that case, everything works. So I'm going to go back to my original code, which was something like header one. And we tried also another header one just to see if it works. Uh, not heading, header, heading, sorry. Another heading one. And we also tried creating a heading two. Sorry, not, no, not a nothing, another, just a heading two. Okay. Um, I hope you're there with me. Yes, I'm coding the proper way. And I removed the F5 shortcut. So finally, I should be able to press F5 how many times I want without changing, yeah, the stream. So F5 all the way in and you will never see pineapples anymore. This is my biggest accomplishment so far. Um, I realized that probably I was not really clear on how to use Visual Studio Code, and I apologize for that. Uh, probably it should be a little more clear, also because there's people that are not able to watch this stream um, right now in real time, but uh, would like to see the recorded version. I'm talking to you, Sara. Don't worry, I'm going to repeat again because Sarah cannot join us today and cannot join us the next lesson, but starting from the, the, the lesson after, she will be able to follow. Uh, but in the meantime, she has to look at the recorded session. So I have to be as clear as possible, super clear. And uh, one thing that I probably forgot to mention is that this text editor is just like any other text editor. So you can create files from inside the text editor and save them later on. Or you can create a text file from outside the text editor, for example, from the file explorer, and then open it in the text editor in Visual Studio Code. But also, this text editor, as many other coding text editors out there, also has this ability to have a file explorer on the side. A file explorer that I can even uh, hide with a combination of keys, which in my case is Control B, but in your case can be something a little different. Control B or Command B should work. Um, I don't know why B. But this file explorer is pretty convenient because it allows me to add a folder to this uh, workspace and this folder can be my project folder, for example. Like in this case, I have the crash course project folder 
and uh, I can see all the contained files and folders. But um, yeah, other than that, it's uh, pretty similar to any other editor out there. And if you still have any problems, just tell me, because it will be pretty easy right now to solve them on Slack in real time. And that's the beauty of uh, having this live course. You're not watching a YouTube video, struggling, not understanding what you're supposed to do, and then asking for help to other people. You are asking directly to the teacher that can stop and help you uh, in any way possible. So we have headings. And as I told you, we can have lots of different headings up to the sixth level. And I'm going to write them all just uh, for the sake of completeness, but it's quite stupid. I can put a heading three. I can put a heading four. And I have some tricks up my sleeve that allow me to write really fast, especially some combinations that allow me to go to the end of the line or something like that. Uh, you're not supposed to go as fast as me. Sometimes I go too fast and you can write on the chat, hey dude, you're going too fast, slow down. I still need to copy the code. So don't worry, just tell me opening, openly and frankly if I'm going too fast because sometimes I, I don't realize. So I'm gonna write all the headings. Ooh, heading five. And finally a heading six. Just to show you that I was taking... How do you jump to the end of the line? Um, I'm doing this. It, on my keyboard, I can do... I have the function key, and then I can go function right, because this keyboard of mine says that function right goes to the end of the line. So there are some special keys on your keyboard that goes to the home, so to the beginning, or to the end of the line. And in my computer, it's pretty convenient because I can use function, left or right arrow keys to go to the beginning or the end of the line. But in your case, it could be a little... Oh, it works for you. Nice. <laughs> okay. Okay, so I created all possible kinds of uh, headings. And if I press F5, no pineapples, no pineapples. And I see all the different kinds of headings. And what if I try to create an, F, an H7? I can try. H7, heading 7. Does it work? I'm going to go back to the browser. I'm going to refresh. Heading 7 doesn't seem like a, a heading at the 7th level because it's not smaller than heading 6. It's a little larger. So it's probably not recognized as a heading. And this is a very peculiar feature of internet browsers in general. If you write good code, they will understand it, interpret it correctly, and show this to you. But if you write bad code, code that makes no sense, the browser will not break. They will try to, to interpret as best as they can. So in this case, the browser will not did, did not understand H7 and probably decided to skip the tag uh, all together and just leave it as a blank, as a plain text. Let's see if this is exactly the same. Yes, it is. So probably the H7 was not recognized and the browser said, you know what, who cares? I'm just not going to treat it as uh, pure text with no tags uh, wrapping the text. Okay. But you also know that apart from headings, you can have paragraphs. And a paragraph is a cool piece of text in which whenever you go to a new line, well, there is some sort of uh, spacing, some separation between paragraphs. There, there is some uh, visible spacing. And in order to create a paragraph, you can use another kind of... Don't we need columns and semicolons in HTML, says Jabata? No, we don't. No, we don't. Um, semicolons and columns are not reserved keywords in HTML. They are reserved keywords in JavaScript, so you, we will use them a lot. And there's also semicolons in CSS. So, yeah, we will deal with columns and semicolons, but not in HTML. And uh, what if I want to create a paragraph? I have to create another kind of tag, and this tag is a P. So I open, the, I open the tag, 
by adding the less than symbol, P as in paragraph, and close the tag with the greater than symbol. As always, Visual Studio Code is auto-completing my tag, my element, so I can just write inside of it. This is a paragraph. And this is my first paragraph. But what I want to show you is that a paragraph is not just text. It's a text with some properties, among which we have some margin. So we can have some vertical spacing that makes the paragraphs not stick together but be nicely separated. So if I create another paragraph right below, this is another paragraph, we will see that there is a difference. I'm gonna stop here and let you write. I know that I'm going really, really fast. And uh, whenever I'm not realizing that I'm going fast, you can tell me. Which is even more difficult because as, you as you're typing, you have to switch to the chat and say, hey dude, slow down, and then you go back to coding. I know, but it is always like that, even in, in offline sessions. So this is one of my, um, yeah, my, my disadvantages, let's say. Okay, so I created a bunch of headings. I, I'm, I don't have a real heading here. I just put some plain text. And now I have two paragraphs. If I now look at the browser and refresh it, I will see that these two paragraphs are pretty well separated. We can say they are separated. If I, go, if I want to go to a new line, with not such an important separation, but I want those two lines to be closer together, I can even use another kind of tag, which is pretty strange. It's a tag that breaks the line into two pieces. So to me, it appears to be the same whether it type in P or just plain text. Yeah, it's happening to me too. In fact, heading seven looks a lot like this is paragraph. So you're right, you're completely right. But there is actually some difference and we will see it together. Uh, for example, if I now want to make a longer syntax here, this is a paragraph and this goes into a new line. Wait a second, because PNTM says, should the page be automatically updated when we do the changes in Visual Studio or do we need to refresh the page? We do need to refresh the page for now because whenever I refresh the page, in fact, Visual Studio Code is always giving me a warning that I decided to ignore for now. But this is a really important warning. Live Reload, this extension that we installed for Visual Studio Code, is not possible without body or head tag. So there are a couple of tags called body and head, which I never explained. And I'm not explaining them because I would like to go step by step, but after this thing that I'm going to show you, we will add body and head tags, and finally the live server will be able to reload automatically without us needing to refresh every time, so don't worry. Uh, so I created a paragraph that says this is a paragraph and this goes into a new line, and this does not go into a new line. So if I want to go to a new line, I can put it in a separate paragraph, or I can use another kind of tag, which is a strange tag. It's different from the other tags. This tag is a tag that breaks the line. In fact, it's a BR. But the strange thing about this tag is that it opens and it doesn't need to close. It doesn't have any content. I don't need to do close BR. I can leave it like that. This is, seems like uh, improper HTML, but it's actually proper HTML. If I want to make it even more proper, then keep in mind that there are some tags that don't need to have any content inside of them, so you don't need to close them with this closing tag. But since they don't have any content, they can open and close in the same tag. 
And how you do that, you put a slash at the end, like this, or with or without the space. That's actually exactly the same. So if you put the slash inside of this opening tag, you are creating something that is called an auto-closing tag. So it opens and closes at the same time. And this is convenient whenever you need to create a tag that doesn't need to have any content inside. Just want to open it and close it. Uh, if I save, I have an automatic formatting feature that added some spacing to me. If you don't have this auto formatting feature, don't worry. Uh, we will still, we will, I will show you this uh, automatic formatting one day, but I'm not going to do it right now because I want to force you guys and myself too to write good code from the start and not rely on uh, software that helps me on formatting. Then, as soon as we are good in formatting manually, we will be able to use the auto formatting features that editors have. So if I now refresh the browser, I see that there is a difference. This is a paragraph and this goes into a new line are actually two different lines, but they are close together. Well, the other paragraph is separated for the pa from the paragraph before because there is some margin between the two paragraphs this kind of spacing is called a margin and the heading 7 is actually working just like it was a paragraph because it has some margin uh, that separates this uh, fake heading 7 from the heading 6 and from the paragraph so what is happening here and this is a good moment to start debugging our code. But before that, I would like to ask you, is everything okay? Are you still with me? No messages so far. Everything good. Um, while we were having a coffee break, I, I saw a little bit the dashboard and we're not many people today. We're just seven viewers and we were five during the coffee break. So I'm assuming probably that one of the reasons that uh, few people have problems is that we have few people <laughs> attending. Uh, I hope that people re looking at watching the recording will not have any problems. Uh, if you have any, just reach out to me on Slack and uh, we can look at this together. I will try to be always available. Well, the time I'm awake, at least. So, thank you, Mixcax, for your uh, feedback. Yes, everything is okay. Then we can continue trying to debug our code. Why is it that I created this code with a heading 7 that is actually plain text, and the browser is telling me a different story. This is a proper moment to debug my code. How do I debug my code? Well, every single browser, every single modern browser nowadays, even Edge, Safari, Chrome, Firefox, Opera, Vivaldi, uh, Bra Brave browser, Matrox, whatever, has a uh, cool debugging feature that allows you to get into the inner uh, internal organs of the website that you're looking at. And one of the easiest way to find this uh, tool is by clicking right on your page. And one of the last elements in this, um, in this menu, maybe even the last one, is inspect. And if you want to use a shortcut, you can use apparently Control shift i in my case. I usually use F12. F12 works pretty well on Linux. I don't remember if it works well on Windows, but I suppose so. And I'm pretty sure that in Mac, F12 doesn't work. So you must find another way. I'm sorry, Mac users. But I'm pretty sure that Command-Shift-I or some other way it, it can, can achieve the same, the same goal. Or there is a menu on the right of Google Chrome and you should find the More Tools Developer Tools, which is pretty much the same thing. In fact, you can see it has exactly the same shortcut, which is Control shift i So I'm, I'm doing this the, in, the, in a way that 
uh, is gonna work for everybody. PNTM says that F12 also works on Windows on Firefox. Great. I, I expected that and I'm really glad it still works. Thanks for this feedback. So I'm gonna click right and I'm gonna do inspect. But usually <coughs> what I do is just press F12. Click right, control shift, um, click right, inspect. <coughs> this is not COVID. This is me talking for almost four hours. <coughs> now we've got this uh, panel here, which is called the developer tools. So they are tools for us, for developers. And I'm going to zoom on the developer's tools too, so you are able to see it a little better. I'm gonna zoom it a lot. Okay, maybe this is enough. So what you are seeing here in the elements tab is the resulting document structure that the browser parsed. And it can tell a slightly different story from what we narrated in the file that we are editing. So we are writing a file in the editor, but the browser interpreted this file somehow. And this is the resulting HTML structure, which is completely different from the structure that we know. You can see that you can expand or collapse different parts of this structure. And as you can see, this is a tree structure because it has a root, just like the root of the file system. And the root is called HTML. So every web document out there on the web is actually an HTML document. And it always starts with a special tag, which is HTML. And the HTML has children. And usually the children are just two. There's a head tag, which as you can see has nothing inside. And it has a body tag. The difference between head and body is not the difference between the header of a website and the body of a website. It has nothing to do with that. The head of an HTML element is a place when, where we put things that are not going to be shown directly in the browser. They are sort of like meta information. And I will show you some of this meta information. But it, when you put things in the head, usually those things are not shown on the browser. Whereas in the body, you put everything that you want to show in the browser. In fact, all the things that I wrote in my editor are now automatically added inside of this body tag. Then we also have this uh, thing here, data, new, gr, c, s, check, loaded. We don't actually know what this is and we don't care for now. <laughs> so let's not worry about this. But as you can see, the structure of this document is way more complex than the structure that we were thinking about and then that we wrote on the editor. It is a deep structure with one root element that has children. Those two children are head and body. Head has no children, but body has children. And the children are all the tags that we created. And the paragraph too, the paragraph with the BR inside is actually a a child that contains children because it contains some text, a BR, and some other text. So even plain text can be considered a child inside of an HTML tag, okay? So this is the proper structure of an HTML document and what we wrote so far is not the proper structure of an HTML uh, document. And that's what's Live Reload was complaining about. This is not a good document because it doesn't have a body or doesn't have a tag. So I'm going to change this code so it has the proper structure now. The proper structure, I'm going to put it on top right here. The proper structure is we want to open an HTML document tag, which is less than HTML close. And this is the first, the, the root element. Then I go back, can go back on a new line. And um, please note that new lines in HTML have no meaning. You can put as many new lines as you want. You can put no new lines at all. They will never be interpreted. 
The only way you can interpret a new line is by using the BR tag, which breaks the line and puts it on a new line, or if you wrap the text into a paragraph, because paragraphs always go into a new line. But any kind of uh, extra spacing and new line that you put will, will completely be ignored by the browser, which is a cool thing because you can uh, space and organize your document the way you like. So we said that HTML is the root element and inside of HTML, we always have two elements, two children. One is called the head and the other is called the body. And as I told you, this has nothing to do with the header, the footer and the body of a document. It has to do with the head that contains invisible stuff and the body that contains visible stuff. Then, Bobby says, it's just HTML, same as the doc type HTML. HTML. No, it's not. Thanks for asking. Uh, this is not even a proper HTML structure. We also need something called a preamble. We don't care too much about how to call this. But a preamble is another special tag that we put on top of the document. It's always one in every HTML document. And it has a, a strange syntax. It's less than, well, it's also, uh, it's also already suggesting it. You have to put an exclamation mark, doc type, which is usually all uh, uppercase, and then HTML. I'm not going to tell you too much about this. Just, let's just say that this preamble tells the browser what kind of HTML this document is, because there are multiple versions, and this is the last version, and uh, it will always be this, the last version. So there's also a preamble that you should put. Uh, don't worry, however, you don't need to write all of this, because in a while I will show you how to create all of this code automatically from the editor without having you to type all of it. Also because typing all of this code could lead to errors, of course, and we don't want to put errors in our HTML document. <clears throat> but anyway, now that we have this strange preamble and this structure, which has the root element HTML, the head child and the body child, we can now start putting all the contents of our website, not outside, I'm gonna cut it, and if you, know how, if you don't know how to cut it, you can just right click, cut, or just do control X, command X. You know how to cut, copy and paste things, right? If you don't know, that's fine. I'm still telling you. <clears throat> so I'm cutting this thing and I'm going to put it in the only place where I know it should be, which is in the body, because the body contains everything that will be shown to the user, while the head will not show anything at all. If you don't trust me, I will show you so this is the final structure that we have. We have a preamble doc type, we have the root element HTML, we have an empty head, and in order to separate it from the body, I'm gonna put a new line, because I think it, uh, it allows me to tell apart these two different concepts. The head is one place, the body is another place. And in the body, I just cut and pasted every tag that I already, that I already created before. Now, if I go back to the browser, this browser is probably automatically refreshed. How can I tell? Well, I can probably change anything in here. For example, heading one exclamation mark, save the file. And if I go back to the browser, it doesn't work. Okay, let me check again. I refresh. Now the re live reload is not complaining. I save again. And now it's working. Okay, I needed a, a last, one last refresh. And now it's actually working. I don't need to refresh the browser anymore because the live reload server is actually reloading automatically. How does it do that? Magic. Or, in other words, JavaScript. In fact, this is not exactly the same code that we wrote. It still has this uh, strange thing here, data new GR, which I have no idea what this is about. And at the bottom of the document, right before the body, the body closes, 
we have these two strange lines that we never created. Whoa, so much strange code here. Well, this is the magic JavaScript that allows the light server to, uh, to auto-inject code and make it work live. But I saw Ricardo saying it's not auto-updating for me. And this is bad. So please paste your... Uh, but it also did not automatically recognize the doc type like for you. Okay, could you please um, send us a screenshot of your current situation on the, uh, on the, on the editor? Okay, that's fine too. So you have doc type HTML, which is fine. This is fine. This is also fine. Hmm. Okay, this seems all good. So could you please show me what happens in the browser? Just a screenshot of, okay. Oh, this is the screenshot. Okay, you called it hello world.html. I would suggest you to call it index.html, but it's fine. Uh, any name is fine. But index is a special kind of name, I will tell you later on. But still, everything seems good here. So we have to check what happens in the browser instead. And this is what happens in the browser. So everything seems fine. But have you refreshed once at least? Because it didn't work for me either. But I had to refresh once. And then I start... Oh, I know what happens to you. You're not using the live server. I'm pretty sure you didn't use the live server. Could you send me a screenshot of the whole browser, including the address? Rani it says, it's so cool, I'm total new by this stuff. Um, and uh, PNTM says, just to make sure, we still need to save for the web to be updated, right? So PNTM, yes, we need to save in order to have these changes um, uh, injected automatically on the server. And Rani it, I love your enthusiasm. I'm so glad that you find it uh, fun. Okay, so you've got... Uh, Oh, you've got a, a, a very different situation. So, rename to index and re-clicked on the live server. Okay, so you just renamed this to index. Watch out because of the capital letter. As I mentioned before, it's much better if you uh, name your files all lowercase, no capital letters. So index with a lowercase i. But it's fine, it still works. And um, still not updating automatically. Wait a second. Where are you? Okay, still here. So um, the live server should actually work. Are you now uh, changing and editing the index HTML? Because sometimes I see problems like you rename a file, but you're actually still editing the old file, not the new file with the new name. So probably now you, s you need to show me again the whole editor, including the, the explorer. Don't cut, don't cut. Just put the whole, the whole window or even the whole screen, that's fine. Because there must be some very trivial stuff that's happening here and it's usually about I'm uh, expecting to live reload my file but I'm actually editing the wrong file, for example. So let's see what Ricardo is going to give us. In the meantime, I see PNTM writing. Where are you from, Ranit? Are you Italian since the name ends with it or is it just a coincidence? Okay, now you've got index.html and this seems all fine. So one thing that you can do right now is to click on this port 5500 to stop the server and re-click on it to reactivate the live server and let's see what happens oh this instead is not good because this address is telling me that you are opening this file from the file system and uh, instead you should be opening it 
Oh, Ran it is it's you, Tina. Okay, you changed your nickname. <laughs> Hi, Tina. So, uh, as I was saying, uh, this address is telling me that you're not using the live server. That's it. That's the only problem. So, in order to open it from the live server, you can either do like I'm doing, so click on port 5500, which will close the live server, and re-click on it to go live, which will automatically open a new tab showing you uh, what you need to, to, to look at. Or, if you're uh, brave enough, you can type this exact same address, which is 1127.0.0.1, column 5500, and then slash index HTML. Pretty, pretty difficult, actually. But it should work. And then with an F12, I'm going to reopen again the developer tools. I'm pretty sure this will work for you now. So we had a couple of problems, but let's see if Ricardo is able to, to solve them with these tips. So there is a, an important difference between opening this file from the file system, such as we, uh, just like we did before. So I'm opening with Google Chrome from the file system. The, the address is very long and it's a file system address. In that case, this is not going to use the, the live server. But in this case, with 127.001.5500 slash index.html, then the live server should work. If I remove these three exclamation marks, I'm having no exclamation marks in here. But Ricardo still has problems. Could follow you until stopping live server and restarting, the new tab opens. And then if you change anything in the code and save it, nothing works? Are you sure you're saving the file? Sometimes it happens that some of our students forget to save the file. It happens a lot. Maybe also because there are some editors that you are already using right now that have autosave feature. For example, Google Documents. Whenever you write a document in Google Documents, there's no save function because every time you stop typing, got it! What happened? <laughs> That's beautiful. Saving indeed. Okay, that's cool. That's really cool. Yeah, it's always like that. You see, I, I, or I have this experience in which I find different error patterns. So if, uh, if you're not following that error pattern, you're probably using that other error pattern. And uh, it's pretty easy to spot them with some experience. So very nice, very good. If you are uh, used to an autosave feature, well, this editor has got you. It has an auto save feature, which I don't like, but if you like it, you can enable it. And if you want to enable it, you can go here on the bottom left, in which uh, there's a gear icon, you click on it, and you can go to settings, and there's a shortcut for this, which is control comma or command comma for Max. The settings page has lots of different settings, maybe too many, but there's also a search feature, which is pretty cool. And you can try to type something like uh, auto save. Files auto save, it's off, but you can turn it on, for example, after delay. After delay means as soon as you stop typing, the editor will start to count. And after some delay, let's say I count to 10, I'll save automatically. He's not going to count to 10, he's going to count a few milliseconds probably. So if I click on after delay, this is it. After one second or a thousand milliseconds, it will auto save your file. If you want to say if you want it to save even faster, you can say half a second, so 500 milliseconds of delay. But in my case, you know what? I prefer to always save manually. So I'm going to stick with autosave off. And uh, I will still save every single time with Control S. But if you like autosave, you're definitely allowed to, 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 to set this feature on your editor, okay? Whoa, this is our really our new, our, our, our fresh website, our HTML document. It was so complicated because we had to write all of this code all by hand. 
and especially this uh, structure, which is always a predefined structure, the preamble, the HTML, the head, the body. I don't want to write all this structure again and again and again for every document that I have to write. But first, Emerald General says, hey there, what kind of chat was that? Oh, Emerald General, we are using Slack and you are uh, more than welcome to join us on Slack. We have also this other chat, which is a little more uh, um, evoluted compared to the Twitch uh, chat because you can paste um, snippets of code and screenshots and you can find the invitation link on the first set of slides. But since it's a little complicated, I'm going to send you the invitation right away from here. So stick with me and I'm going to send you this link. Uh, where are you? Here it is, Emerald General. Feel free to click on that, create an account and you will be with us on Slack. By the way, thanks for joining. I didn't see you before, so you, I expect you to be quite new around here. And I really thank you to stick around with us. Okay. So, oh, I also didn't mention what is inside of the head. So as I already told you, head is a place where you put meta content, metadata, things that uh, you that, that describe the document itself and some extra properties about the document, but not something that is visible. In fact, I don't know what happens if I put a paragraph inside of here. Hello world. What happens if I put a paragraph inside the head? I'm going to refresh this. Uh, I don't need to refresh it because there's a live reload. And yes, I see the paragraph. But if you see the developer tools, the paragraph was actually moved to the body. Be this is because the browser is trying to be as resilient as possible. And if you mess up the place where you are placing the elements, the browser will still try to, to fix your errors and interpret in the best way possible. So he found a paragraph in the head, he moved it as the first element in the body, which should suggest you that you should never put any visible content in the head. I know I'm stressing a lot about this, but I can assure you in past classes, people were still making this kind of mistake, putting visible things in the head. You shouldn't put visible things in the head, you should put them in the body. And welcome Eric, which is Emerald General, I think. So welcome Eric. If you want to follow us in the chat, you can move to the schools channel where we are discussing all of the trials and errors uh, together. Okay. That's really cool. So. Uh, as I was saying, what do I put in the head then? Well, I usually put something like, uh, you can put the title of the document and the title of the document is not the heading. The title of the document is some meta information that is usually read by Google's search engine or any other search engine in order to find your page, understand what it's about and make it searchable on the search engine itself. So usually you can use a title here. It's called title, a title tag, and we can call it, I don't know, portfolio. And this will not be read by the user. It will be read by the crawlers, the bots of your search, of the search engines out there. Bing, Google, what, we, what is there? Is Alta Vista still, still alive? Uh, Yahoo. I don't know, there are so many search engines, but probably one of the most famous, the, the most famous is Google, but there's also many other. Um, another search engine that I can suggest you, for example, is called Ecosia. Ecosia is actually using Bing below, beneath, underneath, but it's a cool search engine because for every X searches that you perform, they will plant a tree. So that's why it's called Ecosia. Oh, DuckDuckGo. Yeah, DuckDuckGo is another cool uh, web search engine. Sure. This is really cool because it cares about your pri privacy online. 
not as not uh, unlike Google does. So yeah, there are some other uh, search engines. I will stick with, with Google still, but uh, yeah, I suggest you to go around and see if there are any other search engines that fit your needs more. But now that we have the title in the head, will it show in the page? No, it will not. But it shows somewhere. It shows in the label of the tab. As you can see, you can see portfolio as the label of the tab. But this happens in some browsers. It doesn't happen in every browser. And if I have this uh, page full screen, I'm not seeing the title in the tab. So don't rely too much on this tag in order to show things to people because people will most likely not see the title. So title is really, really important as a tag, but it's a tag that you should put in the head as an invisible tag that is mainly used for uh, for crawlers, for search engines. And this goes in pair with another tag called description. In description, you write a long detailed description of what your web page is about. So crawlers will not need to read the whole page in order to understand what this document is about. Uh, you can write uh, my first portfolio using the most common HTML tags. I don't know, something like that. And you will see that this description tag will never be, oops. Uh, I think I did a pretty stupid thing, sorry guys. Um, I'm probably a bit rusty with, uh, with HTML. Let's Google it, HTML description. Yeah, okay, sorry, there's no such tag as a description. It's a meta tag called meta with some custom attributes and it's, it's something like this. Sorry for, uh, for mistaking it, but as you can see, these are other examples of meta tags that you can put in the head, in the place where invisible tags happen. For example, you can have a meta tag which says that this page is encoded in a char set called UTF-8, but there are so other, many other uh, char sets out there, and you don't need to know what a char set is right now. The description is not a tag called description, it's a meta with a name of description and a content which contains the description itself. But you can also put keywords, author, and some information about the viewport, so how to zoom the page so it fits perfectly inside of your browser, especially if it's on a, on a mobile uh, device. So meta tags are many, and you can put as many as you want, or put no tags at all. It depends on what you want to do. Some of them are used for search engine optimization. Some of them are used for a better readability and some of them, you will see, allow us to add some code, some more code. But for now, I don't care about description, I'm sorry. Uh, if you really want to, to write something, yeah, you can create a meta tag. So the tag is not called description, it's called meta. And as the, I'm gonna back to, to this. And as the thing says here, you have to add a special thing called an attribute. What is an attribute? As you can see, attribute from, from this uh, tag are key value pairs. So an attribute has always a key, which is the, the name of the attribute, the key of the attribute, and the value of the attribute. Key and value are separated by an equals symbol, and the value is usually put in double quotes. Although nowadays HTML allows to have even single quotes or even no quotes sometimes, but standard HTML will always use double quotes, so I'm going to use double quotes too. So if I want to add uh, an attribute to this uh, HTML element, I can say name equals, and then in double quote, I will say description. So I'm going, this allows the browser to understand that this meta tag is intended to be a description. And all the content that I put inside of the meta tag is not good. I'm going to cut it and leave it away. I'm gonna remove all of this. 
what I should do is like copying the thing that I found here online, I should put another attribute called content and inside double quotes, I should put the content. So it's a, it's a different thing. And as you can see, this special meta tag is very similar to the BR tag that we saw before because it's a tag that doesn't have any text content inside. In fact, it's a tag that auto closes itself. And I have this uh, auto formatting thing that is even adding extra new lines for me, but I'm starting to be quite annoyed by this. So I'm going to, I'm going to stop this auto formatting madness. So my code will be uh, more similar to yours. This should go. I'm not telling you what I'm what I'm doing because there's no no need right now. But still, yeah. Now we should have okay, a document that is not auto formatting anymore. So, I created a meta tag with the name of description and a content of my first portfolio using the most common HTML tags, auto closed the meta tag with no content inside. And I could use it, I could not use it. And as you can see from the auto formatting tool that I had before, I can even put attributes in new lines. This allows for more readability because if I don't put these new lines, I have to scroll left and right in order to read all the code. But instead, if I go to a new line, everything will be visible to me and every attribute will be easily separated one from the other with these two separate lines. Okay, nothing here. So this was a meta tag. You're not supposed to write meta tags, that's fine. Uh, usually you can have meta tags already uh, created for you or you can just, as I did, pretty much copy them from the web. I found this website, which is a very important website, it's w3schools.com that describes every single tag and every single CSS rule, every anything you can, uh, you can find on HTML and CSS is available in this website. Uh, but as far as I know, there's not, really, uh, there's not a really good and comprehensive tutorial in here. Maybe there is, but I, I recently couldn't find one. So I'm using this as a reference in order to understand what is the BDI tag. I click here and I see what the BDI is about. There's a definition usage, the support by the different browsers, and there are usually some attributes, etc., etc. But so I'm going to use it just as a reference. So this is the meta tag, and the meta tag, just like the title, will never be visible to the user. In fact, if I go back to my portfolio, there's no such meta tag here but i find it in the head you see the head now has title and also the meta tag called description which is for the crawlers to consume not for us we can put other meta tags but i don't think it's uh it's important right now what i would like to to show you is that you can actually create the base of this structure with Visual Studio Code, with no coding whatsoever. How do I do this? I'm gonna create a new file in Crash Course folder, and I'm gonna create a new file, and I'm gonna call it, I don't know, about.html, about.html. Hypertext markup language. So it's HTML. Eleven, twelve, one, two. So we are always late. We are already late. We should stop here. Actually, I will um, show you this last thing, and then we're done. In about HTML, I'm gonna write some code, but I don't want to write all the code. So I can start writing HTML, and I have some suggestions here. One suggestions that I really care about is this one here: HTML colon five because we are actually writing a specific version of HTML, which is HTML5. So if I click on here, HTML5, or if I select it with the arrow keys and then press enter, boom, 
we've got all the structure already done for us. There's the preamble, there's HTML with a special attribute called lang n, which tells me that this document is in English. In the head, I have a couple of meta tags that we didn't see before and the title, and we are ready to write something in the body. So about page, I don't know, something like that. And this file is available on the browser if I just changed the address from index.html to about.html. And this is my about page with a strange font actually, but yeah, it works. And I think that's it for today. If I'm correct, we started at 11 my time, so 11, 12, 12, th wait a second, 11, 12, 12, 13, 13, 14. So we have, we've done just three hours, right? So we've got another 45 minutes actually, if we want to stick with uh, four hours of lesson. Are you tired, guys? Uh, is it too much for you? Would you like to stop here? Be frank, be honest. There's no need to stress too much. No, it's cool. No, let's go. Okay, nice. Okay. <laughs> Love your enthusiasm. Okay, so as you can see, I'm not forced to... A bit saturated by bus. Okay, sorry for that. Um, I'll, but we can go on. Okay, okay. I'm not going to say anything difficult right now, so don't worry. Um, but there's an important thing that we now understood, apart from the fact that Visual Studio Code is, about, is able to easily create uh, f documents with the proper structure, you just need to write HTML and follow the proper suggestion. But apart from that, we also learned that there are some special tags. Oh, just a question. Sorry, PNTM. In the preamble, it calls the language for English. Where is the English language stored? Okay, so the English language is not actually in the preamble, because the preamble is this one. This is the root element. And this is not uh, really stored. This is just a suggestion for the browser. Okay, thanks, uh, PNTM. Um, this is just a suggestion from the br for the browser that, say, that says, hey, this document is in English. You know that Google Chrome sometimes, when it finds a document in some foreign language, says, hey, this document is in Italian. Would you, li would you like me to uh, translate it for you? So this is what is triggering the, the suggestion to translate. Uh, I think it's probably mostly this. If I say it as a language, then this document is uh, considered in Italian. And I think that I, that I switched off the automatic translating feature. So I don't remember, I, I don't know how to turn it on again. Uh, allow translation. There should be something, well, let's not, uh, let's not look it right now. But still, uh, you are just suggesting the browser which language is the document going to be, so the browser will behave accordingly. For example, uh, if the browser knows that the uh, that the, the website, the document, is in uh, Turkish, then it will try to interpret the title and the description in Turkish, not in English. So it's just an extra suggestion that we can give to the browser, but we don't need to. In fact, in the index.html, we never put that attribute. Oh, I see crystal clear. Thanks for the explanation. Okay, I, I don't know if it's uh, exhaustive. Maybe that length there is important for other things, but in my experience, I never needed that kind of attribute. But now you know what an attribute is. Tags can have a content, children that are even other tags, other, other elements, but a tag can also have attributes. And the attributes are usually put in the opening tag and are usually a key, equals, and a value in double quotes. This is how you put attributes. And you can put as many attributes as you want. Of course, some attributes have a meaning in HTML, like the lang 
lang attribute that we saw before. And some other attributes have no meaning, such as these two attributes that I created. These two attributes have no meaning whatsoever, and they will just be skipped by the browser. But this is really important because now I can show you the real power of hypertext markup language. So we can have in this page a link that points to the about page. How do we create a link? I'm going to create it here as the last element before the closing body. A link historically was called an anchor, which is an unfortunate name. Uh, just try to memorize this, link equals anchor, an anchor tag. Uh, I know it's bad, but if you try to say link, this tag has a completely different meaning. We need to call it anchor. And as you can imagine, in HTML in the early days, they didn't want to write a tag name as paragraph. They just wanted to call it P because it's uh, smaller, it has a smaller footprint. And the same goes with anchors. The anchor is just A. A is the tag that creates an anchor link, and it's A because it's anchor. And inside of the anchor, I can create any text, and the text will be visible to the user. So I can say, go to the about page. This is the text that the user will see on the anchor, on the link. Let me check if this works. I'm going to the browser and I'm going back to the index.html. And below I see a go to the about page which doesn't look like a link. It just looks like text. And why is that? Well, the reason is that an anchor link is not an anchor link unless it has uh, a destination where to go. So this is not a proper link. We also need to add at least one other thing, which is an attribute. And as you can see, again, the attribute must be created in the opening tag. If I put an attribute in the closing tag, such as this one, this has no meaning in HTML. You cannot put attributes in the end tag, in the closing tag. You have to put them in the beginning tag, in the opening tag. And I know that it's really bad, but in HTML, historically, if you want to specify the destination where to go, you have to use this attribute called href. Why href? because probably it means HTML reference. This is a reference to the HTML document that I want to navigate to. It's really bad, but unfortunately, uh, someone came up with these ugly names and for backwards compatibility, we could never be able to change those names. Otherwise, all the websites will break. So we have to keep these unfortunate names. It's an H with an href. It's an A with an href. It's an anchor tag with a reference to some HTML document. And for now, in order to point to the other HTML document, I'm not going to tell you too much about this, but I'm going to just state the name of the uh, other document. So I'm going to put the file name, which is about.html. This is the other document that I want to refer to. I'm on the index, I have a link, I click on the link, I navigate to the about HTML. This is what makes this text a hypertext. This is what makes uh, the, this is the first element of interactivity that we ever had on web pages. This was a historical big leap for humanity. We didn't have only documents to read, but we had interactive documents that we can navigate back and forth, which is pretty cool. And from this, everything else exploded. So now that I have this link, which is an H A tag with this attribute and then a content, and the content is what is actually visible for, to the user, I can go back to the browser without refreshing, and now this looks like a link. 
It looks like a link and it works as a link. In fact, if I click on it, boom, I'm on the about page. Yay! We've got a real website. It's not just a, it's not just a, a one document, it's two documents links, linked together. Now I'm going to stop here for now and see if anybody has problems with this because I expect lots of people to have problems with this. So I'm sticking here in the code and please tell me if there's any, any problem with what you've done. In the meantime, I don't like moments of silence. So, worked well, works. You're too good for this course. Are you sure you sure you want to attend? <laughs> Joking, I'm really glad. Show how to open a link in new tab. All good, I feel like you created something. And you did, and it's proper HTML. This is something that we do every day as developers. So yeah, you have created something. And uh, later on, the, for, for the rest of the week, you will explore your creativity and you will create your own portfolio like that. Um, Emerald General asks us to show how to open a link in a new tab, which is a really important thing to do. Yes, yes, let's do it. So you know already that if I click on this link, it will just replace the contents of my tab with this, uh, with this new page. And if I want to go back, I need to click on the back uh, arrow icon, or in my case, I can go Alt uh, left arrow to go back into the history. Uh, if I want to open the link on a new tab, I can also right click on the link and use open link in a new tab. This way I can have both documents open at the same time. But in HTML, I have the ability to force the opening of a new tab whenever I click on this link. So whenever a user clicks on this link, they will be automatically redirected to a new tab instead of replacing the actual content. How do I do that? Well, there's another attribute in the link, in the A, and it's really, really strange. But as you can see, this all is um, due to the fact that HTML is a really, really old language and we need to, uh, to keep backwards compatibility. So it's really bad. But we have to use a, an attribute called target. And the content of the target is even m more strange. It's stranger than the key itself. And it's an underscore, a low dash, not a dash, a low dash, an underscore, blank. What? It's like this. There's no, no logic behind, no real reason. Well, maybe there is a logic, but it's a very convoluted logic. But still, if you put an attribute called target equals, and in double quotes, underscore blank, automatically this, links, this link behaves differently. Because now if I click on the link, it's opening a new tab. And I have to close the tab in order to go back to where I was before. Any problems with that? Uh, I'll, I'll give you the time to, to finish copying and debugging. It's really strange. It's another attribute and you can put it right after the href attribute and it's target equals and in double quotes underscore blank. Really cool. Okay. Awesome. So everything is working for you guys. I'm excited. I'm really excited by that. And what about here? Nothing happens. Okay. No, no, no problems. How many attributes can you put on an element and or how many are recommended? Uh, that's also a good question. Well, uh, as you can imagine, every tag has a set of possible attributes. The href attribute is a valid attribute for A, but it's not a valid attribute for P. It has no meaning in a P. And the target attribute is a valid attribute on A, but not on P. So there is a specific set of attributes that you can use for every tag that we have in HTML. And if you want to know them all, you can explore them 
in websites such as w3schools.com. In fact, I'm going to look for the HTML tag called A, which is this one here. And as you can see, this is the bare minimum that you need to know in order to create a tag, which is exactly the same thing that we did. It's an A with an attribute of href, and you can put even the, as you can see, the URL, the complete URL of another website, and then as a content, the text that you want to show to the user so they are able to click on the link. And below, there's an explanation on the definition, how to use it, and now we have a list of all the attributes. There's an attribute called download that allows you to specify what is the name of the file you are trying to download when clicking on this file. There's href, which we know already. There's also hreflang, which I never used in my life. There's media, ping, nothing that I ever heard of. I saw rel, but I'm not going to talk to you about this. There's target, which we already used, and there's also type that allows you to specify the media type of the file you're trying to download if the link is about downloading files, because with a link you can navigate to another page or it's a link in order to download a file and you can specify the media type. So these are the possible attributes that you can put and you just put whatever attributes you need right now. There are some, ta uh, some attributes that are related to accessibility. So if you need to create a website which must be accessible by visually impaired people or um, other people that have difficulties in reading websites, then you must add attributes that add uh, accessibility. Or you can just go with the basics. For example, uh, this tag here without the target was fine, but if I need an extra feature with about, which is about uh, opening on a new tab, then I will definitely need to add also the target attribute. We never added any attributes on the H and the paragraphs so far, but we will add attributes because paragraphs and every other element can also be styled with a style attribute. And you can put some styles inside of the paragraph with some specific rules. There are the rules of the CSS language. Or you can even use other kind of uh, attributes called ID or class that identify the paragraph or the element in general. So I can uh, do something on this uh, element in a separate file. And we will see this as soon as we start doing a little bit of CSS. But I think it's a little too much for today. It's more from CSS, but can you show more of media queries such as why and when to use it? Yes, I will show you media queries. But media queries are, as you said, more related to CSS. So as soon as we start CSS, there's also a small chapter about media queries and how to use them. So yes, I will definitely do that. Stick with us. Um, okay. So we've got this website and this website is, is able to go to the about page. What if I want to have a back reference back to the index page? Uh, I can do this pretty easily. If I go to the about page, I'm going to write something more, uh, uh, more, something nicer. For example, about page could be in an H1 and this is my title. This is the about. Okay. And, uh, then I can write a paragraph that says, uh, this is my beautiful portfolio, which is not, but it will be, okay? It will become beautiful. It's not right now. And then I can create a link, an href that goes back to the index. So I can write index HTML and I say, go back home. I wrote this really, really fast. And uh, I don't expect you to write as fast as me, but I wanted to uh, prove the concept and then you are able to, to write the whole thing by yourselves. And while I'm waiting for you guys to write all this, I'm going to tell you also another thing. I stopped auto-formatting the document, which is much better for me, but now the formatting, which is good, but it has a strange vibe now because the head and the body, even though they are children of HTML, they are indented in such a way 
that they don't seem like children of HTML because they are indented at the same level as HTML. Well, for example, Meta here looks like a child of head because it's indented a step on the right uh, compared to its, its parent element. So in order to improve our uh, readability, the readability of our code, we can look at the indentation of our code. As you can imagine, indentation is not important for the machine because I said you can put as many spaces and as many new lines as, as you want, but the browser will completely skip them and just care about the elements. But it's important for us because we want to read this document and we want some other developer to be able to read this document. What if I removed all elements of indentation here? Oh, this is really difficult to understand. And even worse, if I remove some new lines, if I put everything in one line. What? This is really, really difficult to understand. Wait a second, there's a question. How do we define the font style of a heading? Very good question, and we will see it in CSS. <laughs> I'm sorry, but I cannot tell you all of this right now. We are focusing on HTML right now, and next time we will also see a little bit of CSS. So, as I was saying, indentation is really, really important, and having no indentation or bad indentation is really, really bad for you. Uh, bad indentation could have multiple uh, ways to be bad. For example, Let's say that I'm putting some indentation like this. And if I don't read uh, carefully, at a glance, it could seem that the body is a child of the head, which is not. This is a closing tag, and the body is a completely separate tag at the same level. So bad indentation can be re really, really hard on your eyes and make you read the, the code worse than it is. How do we define... Okay, well, th th this is a, a question that I already answered. So let's try to fix the indentation. And it's very easy to fix the indentation, actually, because uh, in Visual Studio Code, I can select multiple lines by just, uh, you know, clicking and dragging my mouse my or my touchpad. And I can use the Tab key and the Shift key tab key in order to indent the selected block more or less. I'm going to use tab on this selection. You see, it was indented a little more. And I'm going to do shift tab, and now it's indented a little less. So I can indent nothing or indent too much. And with this in mind, I can now start indenting a little more. I know that a head is a child of HTML, so I'm going to indent it. I'm putting a space, a new line between head and body to separate them more, and I'm going to select the whole body block and indent it a little more. And in the head, I've got three children, which are meta, meta, and title. And I can indent them, uh, indent them a little more, so it's uh, obvious that they are children of head. And the same goes with body. Body has three children, and I can indent those three children so it's clear they are children of the body. So now this code reads a lot better than before. And as I already told you, there are some tags that are way too long, and I can uh, even put them on new lines. I can put this here and maybe indent it a little more so it's uh, clear that it's part of the meta. And as for this, I can put it here or I can leave it at the same place. It's up to you. I can even auto-close the tag, as I was saying. But in HTML, this auto-closing, it's not really that important for certain tags. For example, the BR tag, the meta tags, don't really need to auto-close. They can still, they can be open and never closed. It's a quirky thing in HTML, but it still works. Can you show how to import image or video? Yes, I will, of course, right, right away. But first, I would like to uh, clean up a little bit. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to remove target blank from here for now. And this is to show you that now I'm in the index. I have a link. 
I go to the about page in the same page, but now I have a link that goes back to the index. So now I have two pages that bounce back and forth. Or if I want to open everything on, on a new tab, which is kind of stupid in this case, but I can, I can use target underscore blank in the index and target underscore blank in the about page. And now I have an index that opens a tab with the about. And if I go back home, I open a new tab with the index and every link I click will open new tabs and new tabs, which is not really cool. But still, it's something that we can do. So we've done it. Okay. You want to see how to import an image or a video. Why not? Um, I'm going to do this in the about section. I think that this about section should be an uh, about me. This could be your, your CV. This is how you show yourself to the world. So let's, let's uh, change it into an about me section. Um, my name is Anthony, also known as Ice on Fire, because this is my nickname on GitHub. If you are curious about it, I will tell you one day why this is like that. Uh, it's not just because I found it a cool name. And, um, and on 9 gag, I'm actually Ice Under Fire, which is only because Ice on Fire was already taken. So the bottom line is I use Ice and Fire and something in between. Uh, you can put meta elements in only one tag, says Mick. No, actually, you cannot. As far as I know, every meta element should be in a separate meta tag. Okay, so um, I think that's uh, that's already fine as my CV. Then I can uh, put more things. But now I, can, I want to put a picture of myself. So how do I put a picture of myself? How do I put an image? Well, there is a tag called IMG, which is a stupid way to... To, to contract the world, the word image. Because I don't know why, uh, in earlier days, everything should have been contracted. Uh, everything should have been... Can I later talk about div? Yes, yes, I will also talk about divs. Don't worry, I will talk about everything that's important to you. Um, so we can use an image tag, which is another one of those tags that auto-closes itself because it doesn't have any content. It has lots of attributes, however. And the most important attribute is the SRC attribute. SRC, which means source. The source to where, where to find the image to show to the user. So the image has a source. And what kind of source do we have? Well, if we had an image in this, in this folder, we could just uh, use it by name. And uh, I'm going to look for an image. Well, I know where my image is. I, I can just look for myself. But you can look for anything. Uh, a whale, a shark, or... Okay, these are some images of me and people related to me. Uh, this is my latest image. Here I was way too young. Here I was young and also fat. I think that this represents me more because it was shot... Uh, more recently. So I want to save this image and I'm going to right click on myself, save image as, and I'm going to find the same folder where I am creating my portfolio, which was in my case Academy, Glorious Academy, Crash Course. This is the place. And if I want to be kind to myself, it is much better if I give this image a easy name. Otherwise, it will be really difficult for me to reference this image. So instead of 3750603, I'm going to call it profile. The extension is fine, JPEG. Okay, if it's a JPEG, why not? And I'm going to save it. This thing that I, already, that I just did just uh, gives me this image in the same exact folder where, where my HTML documents are. And now that I've got my profile image here, or you can put whatever image you have on your computer or from the web, uh, just try to find an image, put it here, give it a name that is easy to read and easy to write. And now I can just write profile.jpg 
as the source, as the SRC of this image. And with a bit of luck, I go to the About page, following this link, and boom, my ugly face is all over the page. Too big, way, way too big. Can I make it shorter? Yes, I can. There are a couple of attributes that I can put, optional parameters, op optional attributes that I can add to my image tag. And one of them is width, and the other is height. But I can just choose to have only one of the two. For example, if I want to control the width, the height will be adjusted accordingly, uh, maintaining the aspect ratio. If I just want the height, I will deal with the height and the width will adjust accordingly to, uh, according to the aspect ratio. Or I can set them both. And in that case, uh, I'm probably messing up with the aspect ratio because I, have a, I can have a width which is really long a height which is really short and I can have my image stretched as much as I want. I'm gonna go with the height right now. So I'm gonna fix that the height should be, I don't know, a hundred pixels, a hundred pixels high. Uh, I don't need to say pixels, it's just 100 and this should work. Yeah, it works. So now my picture is a little smaller and it's, it fits in the page at least. Another strange thing that happened, however, where do I put the BR to put the go back home under the picture? Oh, that, you're already one step ahead. The picture is now at the sa in the same line as go back home, and it's not really nice. I want go back home to be on a new line um, rather than the picture. So how can I change this? Well, I can do multiple things. One is, as Veronica suggests, I can put a BR, and I can put a BR anywhere between the image and the link. I can put it right here at the right of the image. I can put it on the left of the link or as I like to put it, I put it on a new line. So image, then a BR, then a link. And this will allow me to break the line and have the link just below the picture and not on the same level. Why is that? Why did the picture go on, a, on, on the same line as the link unless I put a BR? Well, the reason is that some elements in HTML uh, have uh, display as blocks and a block is uh, uh, an element that always go into a new line. But some other elements don't display as blocks, they display as inline elements which means that they go, don't go into a new line and they are in the same line. So one thing that I haven't told you um, yet is that H1s and Ps behave as blocks because they always go to a new line. But images and links and other tags that I will show you instead behave as, new line, as inline elements. So they don't go to a new line by default. You can change this behavior with CSS, with styling, or you can use some more tags in order to achieve the same, um, well, the, the same goal. For example, if you don't want to use a BR, you can wrap the image inside of a paragraph. Like this. Now we have a paragraph containing an image and I'm going to stress it even more by adding some uh, indentation. The paragraph, has an image inside of it, and the image is on its own line. It even added some margin that wasn't there before. PNTM says, I noticed that in the image I didn't end with a backslash, so is there instances where the backslash isn't a necessity? Uh, yes, yes, in HTML there are some tags that are auto-closing, such as image, such as the BR that I created before, uh, the BR like this one, or the meta tags. Well, in HTML, pure HTML, it is not really needed to add the final slash. Uh, you can just open the tag and never close it, and HTML will interpret it as an auto-closing tag. But HTML is not the only language that uses tags. In fact, there are other languages, such as XML, 
on which HTML5 is based, they are more strict. And whenever you open a tag, you must always close it. But here we are in HTML and we can relax a little more. So yeah, you can auto close these tags or you can not auto close these tags and they will still work. Um, another thing is, as you mentioned, the visually impaired, can you add a description for the image? Yes, why not? So there are so many other attributes for the image that I can add and I don't remember them all. So let's go back to W3 schools. Let's look for the image tag, which should be here order alphabetically. And now I see that the image tag has lots of other attributes. For example, in, in this example here, we've got an SRC. We've got the width and a height that I already mentioned. Uh, PNTM says, apologies, slash, not backslash, and thanks for the answer. No, no worries. <laughs> yeah, it was a slash, not a backslash. And as you can see, we have another attribute here, which is alt. Alt means alternate text. And the alternate text uh, shows up in two cases. Well, no, it shows, it shows up in one case only, when the image is not available, when the image is not visible, which happens in two cases. Either the image has a wrong path, it was deleted, so we will still see an alternate text in that case, or for the visually impaired. The visually impaired cannot see the image, so they have screen readers softwares, uh, screen reader software on their computer, and whenever the screen reader software stumbles upon an image, instead of showing the image, since it cannot, it will read the alternate text for them. So I'm going to add this other attribute called alt equals, and in this case, I'm gonna say my ugly face, okay? Now, now that I have this alt attribute, I can jump back to my web document and see that nothing really changed. I don't see anything. But, for example, if I mess up with a picture, for example, this picture is not available because I misspelled the name. I put profile.jpg and not profile.jpg, so the image is not retrieved correctly. Then I see the alternate text instead of just having nothing. I see the icon of a broken image, but given the alt text, I can imagine what the image was supposed to be. That should show my ugly face. And uh, if the image is uh, instead correct, but I'm visually impaired, I can ask a screen reader to read this, uh, this page for me, and this screen reader will probably say, speak out loud, my ugly face. And I'm really sorry, but I don't really know how to enable screen readers here. But I can try. Uh, I can do something like um, accessibility, universal access in uh, Linux. And I can try to see screen reader on. Screen reader on. Screen reader dial off the screen reader reads displayed text as you move the focus. Screen reader toggle button pressed. 24 push button. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, if I go here on the browser... Document bro content entry selected. About me, Google Chrome. Document web. My ugly face image. Finished loading about me. Page has one heading, one visited link. Did you hear it? It says, my my ugly face. He, he, he said it at a certain point. I don't know if you if you got it, but... That was a uh, quite... Left alt. Window. Settings. Push button. Screen reader off. Okay, it's really freaking me out. Uh, I closed it, and that's fine. So, screen readers are able to see that alternate text. So, you are, uh, you are creating a more accessible uh, document, okay? And there are so many other, so many other uh, attributes that you can put. Um, some of them are pretty important, but I'm not really sure that they are all here. Probably yes. Okay, yeah. Uh, I remember that there was another thing that I can uh, uh, I can move on top of this image and I can see a tooltip, but uh, I don't see it. What happens if I say description? I, I'm oh no no wait t title. Let me check if the title works. Hello. Yep. As you can see, if I put the title attribute. Whenever I hover on the image, I will have a tooltip that says 
whatever I put on the title. So there's another thing that is not for the visually impaired, but still, if you want some uh, extra information on this image and not having to put it on the on a lower paragraph, but you can use it on a tooltip, here it is, which is good for desktop browsers. But it, as you can imagine, on mobile browsers, uh, this has no use because on mobile browsers, there's no such thing as hovering on something. You either tap on it, double tap on it, shrink, zoom, pinch, whatever, but you're never going to hover on it. So don't abuse of this title attribute because this will only work on desktop browsers and well, browsers that have a mouse at least. And do we have a title here? I don't see the title. Um, no, I don't see the title here. And uh, this is probably due to the fact that the title attribute is not something that only images have. Maybe the title can be used for other elements too. So they probably specify the title attribute somewhere else and not in the image page. But anyway, we already done a lot of things and we didn't follow at all this um, this tutorial that I was uh, that I was mentioning that I was uh, suggesting you, but this was on purpose because I would like you to start um, uh, using different sources of truth. I am one of the sources of truth. I explain things my way, and this website, this tutorial, will explain things their way, which is even better, maybe or maybe not. But having multiple sources will allow you to uh, have a more comprehensive understanding of, uh, of everything. So if you want, you can continue fiddling around by creating, you can follow this tutorial if you want. You will, you're gonna create the HTML document, creating the index. Here it's explaining why it's called the index HTML, which I didn't. Um, it's going to show you how to use the live server, it's talking about indentation, something that I did too. Um, it's talking about el tags, elements comprised of tags and the different attributes. Wait a second, because PNTM says, so did we discuss about the debugging of the heading lol? Um, yes and no. No, we just saw that uh, we, dis we, oh, d do you mean the heading, the, the heading seven or other kinds of heading? Because we saw here when uh, debugging in the developer tools that heading 7 is actually just um, interpreted as pure text. So that's the only thing that we needed to know. As for the head, which is not the heading, we know that the title is not visible in the page, it's visible only in the, well, in the title of the tab and it will be visible for crawlers. Yes, heading seven, okay. Yes, heading seven doesn't exist. How do I know this? Well, I can study <laughs> or I can experiment, which is even more fun than studying. And I can try to create this heading seven, hoping it works. It's probably not really working. And uh, well, the only thing I can tell you is that this h7 is not interpreted as a as a heading because i see no styles here on the right whereas if i click on the h6 i see some uh, strange code which is css code that we're going to discuss uh, next time and this css code is actually the rules that are applied to this h6 so this is probably proving to me that h7 is not uh, a tag is not a valid tag. We have headings, headings from H1 to H6, and I think that H3 is already too much. So don't go further. Uh, we want a title, we want a subtitle, maybe we want a sub subtitle, but let's not go further than that. So I'm gonna remove the heading seven once and for all. Okay, so we've uh, done a lot of things and there's four minutes left until the end. So I um, don't think I'm going to show you how to embed videos right now, but you can imagine it's really, really similar to what we've done to the image. If there is an image tag for images, will there be a video tag for videos? Let's have a look. And there it is! Yes, there is a video tag with a width, a height. You can even specify this special attribute called controls with no value. It's just a, an attribute with a key and no value. And this 
if you add it to the HTML, will add controls to the video player. So the play button, the scroll bar, or the, the, yeah, the pause button, etc., etc. Or you can not move, put the, the, the control. And you can put source elements inside the video. You can even put multiple source elements. So uh, for if you have the MP4 version, you put the MP4 version and you specify that the type of this file is an MP4. If you have an OGG, you specify this one. Or if uh, your browser does not support any videos, you can put an alternate, an, an alternate text that says, sorry, your browser does not support the video tag, which is kind of strange because even if it supports the tag, you still write this line, but this line will not be visible if your browser is supporting the video and is showing the video. So it's really, really easy to embed elements inside of your website. And this is what I am encouraging you to do for next time. So we couldn't publish on Netlify, uh, we will probably do it next time. But as for now, you can fiddle around, create multiple pages and build your HTML only portfolio with all these things. Uh, what the difference between video and iframe? Well, the iframe is a completely different thing and I will explain it later on if you want. But iframe is actually a way to embed a document inside of the document. So. Uh, I'm going to do it here. If I do iframe, and I think it's a so SRC. Ooh. Something like that. Let's see what happens. Okay, I probably miss... Oh, no, I... Okay, no. Uh, okay, this iframe is a block that should load Google's page inside of this block. So I have a... A website inside of a website but as you can see it's not working and it's not working anymore it has been working for years and now it's not working anymore because of security reasons they don't want you to display other websites coming from other domains if you don't have the proper um, the how do you say the if you have you don't have the proper permissions okay so this is not allowed anymore from certain websites for example from google chrome uh, from google let's see if uh, w3 schools works oops okay i'm gonna put w3 schools no that this doesn't work either so it's a security issue it's a security problem and uh I can try to put the index HTML, which comes from the same server, and this is working. You see? Now I have the index embedded inside of my about. But it's a complex thing that usually we don't need. So it's a very secondary kind of tag that I'm not going to discuss too much in detail. And you can check it by yourselves. Um, um, once you understood completely uh, how HTML tags work. So what I encourage you to do is to, if you want, you can still go to um, to, to this code makery uh, tutorial and check how to insert an image. Uh, there's there's also a thing about relative and absolute URLs. If you want, you can do this with me next time. Don't worry, and we are still going to do more and more things, such as creating uh, CSS styles, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So it's up to you. If you want, you can follow this tutorial and see if it's uh, good enough for you so you don't need my help in, uh, in discussing this, uh, this tutorial with you. Or you can do another thing, which is creating your HTML portfolio by adding as much content as you want, uh, maybe personal content of yours. So you can create your CV, you can create a gallery page, you can create a video page if you have videos to show. And then we will continue from your code, from our code, uh, we'll continue on styling things and making them cooler and uploading them to, uh, to the internet. We will use a, a, a cloud service called Netlify, which is one of those cloud services that has a free plan that allows you to, to upload things on the web for free. Uh, but when you want to import video from YouTube on your own page, it is shown in iframe. Yes, this is true. Uh, but still, when you embed a video from YouTube, you are not writing the iframe, the iframe yourself. You are uh, using some code that YouTube's, YouTube gives you, I think. Or pro I'm probably wrong. Let me check. 
go to YouTube. I'm going to check. Uh, I'm going to check a random video. I'm into music, so you will see lots of videos about guitar, bass, even saxophone. And if I do an embed, where's the embed? Share. I want to embed. Oh, what was the first one? Embed. And yes, okay, you're right. This is an iframe. And the iframe is a way to open a portal to YouTube inside of a specific point. So I'm going to put it here. And what happens in my about page? Yes, I have this uh, special iframe that shows the YouTube video. And the reason why YouTube decided to use an iframe is that they have lots of tags and JavaScript code and CSS code. And the iframe is a good way to encapsulate, to hide all those internal details from you. So this is a very specific problem and solution that YouTube found in order to embed things in an easy way for us. We just need to copy and paste a special tag that we don't even need to understand what it does, but it just works, which is pretty cool. Um, other things, this lesson was awesome. I learned so much. Thank you, Anthony. Can't wait for the next one. I'm really glad to hear that. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Tried adding a video, but the, the go back home link disappears. Looks like a debugging homework for me. Yes, watch out because maybe there's no closing iframe tag. Maybe that's the reason why. Uh, sometimes it could be like this. Jabata says, hey man, don't be discouraged that you currently don't have a lot of viewers. Your recordings of the previous lessons have 100 plus viewers, so I guess most of the others watching have already some experience and would join at a later stage when you reach the parts that are unclear for them. So far you've been awesome and I'm learning a lot. I really thank you so much for this positive feedback. I am really, really appreciate it. As much as I appreciate negative feedback, so don't worry, I'm not really discouraged by the, uh, f the, 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 the short amount of people and your words are really encouraging me, so thanks a lot. Um, but please, give me also negative feedback because I want to improve. I want this thing to be the best thing out there, okay? So, and you can give me a huge hand in this. Also, another thing before we stop, uh, I hope you're not away. Um, Next Saturday will be the 31st, so it's Halloween. Do you have any problems with uh, doing lesson on Halloween or do you have parties to attend, even though the COVID should stop you from doing parties? But anyway, if you have any problems in doing the next lesson on the 31st, you don't have Halloween, okay? Uh, I will not have Halloween either. But still, if you really care about Halloween and there are so many people among you that really care about Halloween, we can just skip the lesson next week and go to the next one. But by default, I'm going to do the lesson next week. In the meantime, okay, everyone is saying no problem for next week. Awesome. In the meantime, thanks a lot for sticking with me. Uh, hello to everybody who's going to watch this uh, after, to watch the recording after. The lesson is great and your pacing is fine. We don't do Halloween here, so lessons, please. Same. Will you be wearing a costume? I could. Let's see. I don't have a full costume, but maybe I can find something. Why not? Yeah, could be fun. And, uh, okay, that's over. Over and out. And remember to eat pasta, code FASTA. Bye.